It's been close to a year since my last Everything Known About Ashes of Creation video. In that time, we've gotten a lot of new information about nodes and freeholds and a bunch of other systems, so this video ended up being quite a bit longer. If you want to support the channel, there are many free and paid ways to do so. Links are all in the description for the paid ways. But the free ways, liking, comment, and subscribing, and simply just watching the video all the way through are probably the best ways to support the channel. If you need a guild for Ashes, Genesis Guild is recruiting. Links are in the description for that. One thing I want to mention now, so I don't have to mention it too many times throughout the video, if you hear me talk about a system that I haven't explained yet, don't worry, eventually I will explain it at some point in this massive video. As always, I have to give a big thanks to the wiki team led by Lex. I don't think you will find a wiki for an in-development MMO that is as extensive as that one is. It's, it's really remarkable what they've done with it. Part of what makes the wiki so expansive is how much information we have for this MMO. This is an open development MMO. Steven has done countless interviews. We've done NDA free testing a few times. And they do a developer live stream every single month. So we have all kinds of information. That's why the wiki is so expansive. So there probably has not been an in-development MMO where we know as much about the project as we know about this one. On top of knowing a lot, the project is crazy ambitious and has a very very large scope and again so that is why this video ends up being very very long so now we're going to start with an overview of what ashes is and then we're going to get into deep dives on every single system in this game ashes of creation is an in development mmo set in a high fantasy world where players choices will shape and define the world around them it is a PvX game that has both PvP and PvE elements that are intertwined. The game emphasizes risk-to-reward mechanics and eliminates the concept of participation trophies which we see in most modern MMOs. There will be prestigious gear, items, and other forms of player housing that not everyone will get. Intrepid does take feedback from players and does make changes based on that feedback, but the core design pillars of the game will never be changed. Those design pillars are as follows, engaging an immersive story, reactive world, player interaction, player agency, and risk versus reward. Ashes is inspired by the following MMOs, EVE Online with its regionalized economy and risk versus reward in transportation of materials, Arcage with its building, transportation systems, and naval combat, Star Wars Galaxies with its crafting systems. Lineage 2 with its risk versus reward, castle sieges, PvP flagging, open world PvP, and guild progression systems. Ashes is a sand park MMO that blends theme park and sandbox elements. The node system encapsulates this hybrid approach where player actions will decide which of the 85 nodes on a server become the dominant nodes that grow to be giant cities, but the location and type of the 85 nodes is set and the layout of the node while it can be changed is not fully freeform like player made cities in a sandbox MMO might be, but it is not like theme park MMOs where the cities are all made by the developers. Ash's combat leans toward tab, but there are a lot of template skill shot style abilities, projectile and player occlusion, and other elements that make it feel a little bit more action based than normal tab games. There are 64 classes and 9 playable races in Ashes. The artisan system houses the gathering, processing, and crafting of Ashes, and is a huge part of the game since the best gear is made by crafters. Ashes has a lot of PvE and PvP systems. PvP is always on in Ashes, but but it is not a full loot PvP MMO. Instead, only a percentage of your gatherables will drop, and the corruption system is intended to be a massive punishment to those that gank people who do not fight back. So it is not as hardcore as a lot of previous always on PvP MMOs. PvP systems in Ashes include the open world PvP with corruption system, and many systems that do not use the corruption system and instead used opt-in systems. These include caravans, node and castle sieges, node and guild wars, naval PvP, and arenas. PvE systems include story arcs, quests, dungeons, raids, events, naval gameplay, and world bosses. The world of Ashes is known as Vera and is a massive 1200 square kilometer world map. Instant travel options in this world will be very limited, but there are many faster travel options that will be available including mounts, flight paths between nodes, and a road-based public transportation system. Ashes is planning to enter Alpha 2 testing in the third quarter of 2024. Alpha 2 is a persistent alpha that will run until the betas and then will become the PTS server at the launch of the full game. 
By the end of Alpha 2, the game is expected to be feature complete, but certainly not at the beginning of Alpha 2. Alpha 1, which was an NDA free test, was completed in August of 2021, and Alpha 0 was completed in December 2017. Intrepid Studios was founded in 2015 and launched a Kickstarter for Ashes in 2017 that raised over $3.2 million, a record for the platform at the time. As of January 2023, they had sold over 100,000 Alpha 2 packages, which at $250 per pack would be $25 million in funding for just Alpha 2 packs, which does not include any additional pack sales since January 2023. Also, it does not include higher or lower tier pack sales. The project is primarily self-funded, with the founder of Intrepid Studios, Stephen Shreve, having invested at least $45 million himself. Overall, the project does not lack funding at all. Intrepid is also self-publishing the game in North America, Oceanic, and Southeast Asia on Windows PC only. They plan to localize the game in the languages seen on screen with more languages as needed. Ash's development did not really ramp up until around 2021, when the team finally hit 100 employees. Intrepid has an open development policy with this game, where they showcase the game every single month during development. There's one area of this game I will not do a deep dive on for this video, and that is the lore, as it would make an already massive video much longer. But if you want a full down of the existing lore, there are some fantastic articles on the wiki that I will link. But for a basic rundown, the world of Ashes is known as Vera. The world was hit with an apocalyptic event known as the Apocalypse, the Fall, or the Exodus. This apocalypse caused the majority of its citizens to flee in the Exodus to a world that is void of magic known as Sanctus via portals known as Divine Gateways. Some unlucky citizens didn't quite make it through the gateways in time and fell back to the planet to fight for survival. These divine gateways were dormant for millennia. The game will start with players returning to the world of Vera via these divine gateways after all of this time has passed. And that is as far as I will go with the lore for now, but be sure to check out the links in the description if you want to know more. And that is a very brief, high-level overview of Ashes of Creation. Next, let's start getting into all the details of the game. We'll start with the biggest system of Ashes, and one that basically every single system interacts with in some way, the node system. First, let's do a high-level overview of nodes before getting into the details. Nodes are the defining feature of Ashes. On the world map, there are 85 regular node locations planned for launch, with an additional 15 castle nodes for a total of 100 nodes. There are four distinct node types, which we will get into very shortly. Each node location is a place that can be developed by players through player activity. As nodes level, they transform from wilderness all the way to a bustling metropolis. Nodes have a surrounding zone of influence that expands as the node levels. There's a vassal system that kicks in when the first node in an area hits stage 3. When this happens, all surrounding nodes are vassals of that stage 3 and cannot advance above stage 2. And now the details of nodes. Nodes have a zone of influence or ZOI that they control. The entire world map is covered in these ZOIs with no gaps. Any player activity that also gives player experience within these ZOIs also contributes experience to the node within each discrete ZOI. Most activities in the game give player experience, such as questing, gathering, processing, or crafting in the artisan system, events, PvP, or grinding mobs. As nodes level, their ZOI does expand to encompass surrounding nodes if those nodes do become vassal nodes. And the ZOI of a node, of course, will contract if a node is destroyed. There is also an Underrealm in Ashes, and the Underrealm does contain nodes. Nodes directly above Underrealm nodes are considered adjacent and not within the same zone of influence. As there can only be five Metropolis nodes, which is the highest stage of a node on a server, each Metropolis node controls a large portion of the world map. The four node types are as follows. Divine nodes, which provide faith, skill, and equipment augment focuses, have priests as the NPC type and use favor as the special node currency. Next, we have economic nodes, which provide trade and merchant focuses and have merchants as the NPC type, and the special node currency is not yet known. Next, military nodes, which provide combat and class training focuses, have guards as the NPC type and use honor as the special node currency. 
Finally, scientific nodes, which provide artisan and construction focuses, have scholars as the NPC type, and again, the special currency is not yet known. Node types are static and predetermined across all servers, so if a divine node was at this location, for instance, it would be there on all servers. However, it might not be leveled to the same stage on each server, so each server could be very different in theory. Each node type can affect the services and systems available at each level of node advancement. The structure of the node government and how mayor elections work is different in each node. Narrative and story arcs at each node type can be very different. Node buildings that are available and amenities provided by these buildings can vary at each node. Nodes have seven total stages of development starting at stage 0 and up to stage 6. The names of the node stages, alternate names, time frame to advance to that stage, and player housing available are all shown on the table on the screen. As you can see, the first few stages are pretty quick, the last few stages will take a long time for players to achieve. Nodes advance once enough experience has been accrued by the node as long as they are not blocked from leveling by the vassal system. The advancement of a node unlocks its unique content, but this advancement can lock out other nodes from unlocking their unique content via the vassal system. The first stage of development happens very quickly and only unlocks a few NPC services such as vending or banking. Further stages provide a lot more services, node buildings, and more housing options, and the overall footprint of the node increases with each stage. The territory expansion algorithm is instrumental in determining how a ZUI of a node expands. This algorithm takes into account nearby coasts, neighboring nodes, and a heat map of player activity in surrounding areas to determine how a node's ZOI will expand when a node levels. Due to the way this algorithm works, it is possible to have two nodes of the same stage adjacent to one another. Parent nodes will receive XP from vassal nodes once the vassal node has hit the level cap imposed by the vassal system. Citizens from another node can contribute XP to level up other nodes. The four node types will receive equitable XP gain to not favor any one node type leveling first. When a node advances, a series of animations will occur. Players will be teleported to a safe location away from the node as these animations and the level up process takes place. The node layout and style as it levels is determined by location, biome or region the node is in, the node type, the race that contributed the most experience to the node which can change at each node stage as the node levels, and the mayor can alter some of the appearance and layout of the node as well. Moving on to the vassal system which has seen some major design changes since last year's video. The vassal system is the system in which higher level nodes enslave nearby nodes, converting them into vassal nodes. The image on the screen breaks down the high-level view of how this works. A stage 6 node can control two stage 5 nodes. A stage 5 node can control a stage 4 and stage 3 node. A stage 3 can either control a 1 or a 2. Further, if a stage 3 node is destroyed in a siege, the vassalized level 1 or 2 nodes beneath it are also destroyed. This is the only scenario where destroying one node in the siege destroys vassal nodes. Vassal nodes must always stay at least one stage below their parent node. This lockout starts with the first node to hit level 1 blocking all surrounding nodes from hitting level 1 until that node hits level 2. The vassal system does not start until a node hits stage 3, then that stage 3 node will control one stage two or one stage one node based on the territory expansion algorithm outcome. Another new addition to the vassal system is that a fully developed server with five metropolis nodes could have as many as 20 buffer nodes that are not within any vassal network. So of the 85 regular nodes on a server, only 65 can become part of a vassal network. It is not known how high these buffer nodes can level other than they can't get to stage six for sure since only five stage six nodes are allowed on a server. But regardless of level, these buffer nodes will still be instrumental in reshaping the server after successful node sieges occur. Lower level nodes in the vassal chain will send experience to parent nodes if they are capped on how high they can level. Vassals are subject to government policies, alliances, wars, taxes, diplomatic states, and trade of their parent node. Vassal nodes gain benefits from their parent node, even if the node type of the parent node is different. Taxes are collected from vassalized nodes by the parent node, and can only be used within the node government UI. Nodes within a vassal chain cannot declare war on one another. 
Node wars can only be declared outside of a node's vassal chain. Zones and Ashes are a lot different from a lot of other MMOs. There are no traditional zone level ranges that you move through in a linear fashion. Instead, as a node levels, higher level content will unlock. Within the ZOI of a node exists content for many different level ranges with the highest level content requiring a stage 6 node. Node atrophy is another mechanic of nodes that causes a node to lose experience. Every day a set amount of atrophy will occur which is subtracted from the experience earned by the node for that day. After this subtraction, if the total experience for the day is negative, then the node might see negative repercussions such as some node services being disabled. Or the node could even be destroyed if enough negative experiences accrued over time. The benefits of each node vary based on the node type. Upon reaching stage 6, the highest level a node can reach, nodes unlock a special superpower ability. Divine nodes might unlock a procedurally built mega catacomb dungeon beneath it that connects it to its divine vassal nodes. This dungeon might house unique bosses with unique drop tables. Economic nodes at the metropolis stage unlocked the linked economy superpower. This allows auction house listings to be linked with any other stage 6 economic nodes on the server and with any economic nodes that are a vassal of the metropolis node. Normally you would have to travel to the node to bid on items. Now you can bid from any of the linked auction houses. One auctions of raw materials will be deposited in the player's warehouse at the node they are listed at and if needed elsewhere will have to be transported by the player. Finished items one will be mailed to the player. Scientific nodes at stage 6 unlock teleportation within their vassal network which can extend across seas and include island nodes. If there are multiple scientific metropolises on a server then an airship will provide faster travel between the two metropolis nodes as long as the two nodes are not at war. There are a lot of benefits of the different node types that are not yet known but stay for 2025, we might have a lot more information with Alpha 2 starting this year. Moving on to node citizenship, player housing is the primary method for a player to become a citizen of a node. Once housing is acquired in a node's zone of influence, players can then claim citizenship within that node. There are several different types of player housing available in Ashes, which we'll expand upon later. There is not a hard cap to node citizenship, but there is a soft cap. This soft cap essentially is related to the cost of becoming a citizen. Housing will become more expensive the more citizens there are of a node, thereby throttling the amount of players that can become a citizen of said node. Players can only be citizens of one node per account. Of all your characters on the account that are on a specific server, only one of them can be a citizen of a node. Players can renounce their node citizenship, but they will have a two-week cooldown before they can become a citizen of a new node. Renouncing your citizenship after your node has been declared for sieging may incur penalties. Node citizenship is lost automatically if your node is sieged and destroyed, and in that case there is not a cooldown to claim citizenship of a new node. Players that have their node destroyed will have refugee status and this will allow for things like reductions in the fees for becoming a citizen of a new node and other reduced fees at their new node. Node citizenship is a separate system from guild membership. Guilds do not own nodes, instead guild and node citizenship are a completely separate thing. There are however patron guilds of a node which we'll elaborate on in the future. There is a node board that players can interact with that shows who is a citizen of a node. Details of each citizen are available here that show detailed information about their guild, society, religion, and property ownership. Citizens of nodes receive a number of benefits. These include reduced taxes for node services, reduced tax rates, access to the node's reliquary, access to exclusive unique vendors based on the node type, access to merchants that offer specific types of enhancement stones or stat migrations, access to limited functions and service buildings within the node, access to upper tier crafting benches, access to buffs from certain events, access to special node related titles, access to certain social organizations and religions, participation in the node's government including voting and running for office, and benefits to a player's node reputation. Non-citizens can still access generic node services, mundane crafting benches, and standard rewards from node quests. But citizenship does unlock a lot more than is available to the general public. 
Next, on to the method to become a citizen of a node, the player housing systems. Player housing is available in the form of apartments, freeholds, inns, and static housing. Players can have one apartment and one in-node static house per server, with freeholds being only one per account. The table on screen shows the housing types, whether they are instance or open world, when they can become available starting count and the limitations on how many a player can have. Static in node housing is non-instanced and there is a limited amount available per node, which increases with node stage. There are 8 cottage buildings at node stage 3 and these houses level up and grow with each node stage to eventually become mansions at the metropolis stage. With 5 metropolises being the max, then 40 is the theoretical maximum number of in node mansions available. The table in the screen shows the in-node housing sizes that are available at each node stage. New property becomes available at each node stage, but it is akin to the size of the previous node stage. In-node housing is owned by players, and players can sell those houses to other players. If a player is delinquent on taxes, the node might take over ownership of the housing, and it might be resold to a new player who will have to pay the back taxes and late fees to the node. Static in-node housing benefits include garden areas for planting crops, crafting benches, and presumably a lot of other things that we do not know as of yet. The architecture of the static housing is again predetermined by the racial influence of the node. Apartments are cheaper, instance housing options that players can rent. At node stage 3, there are 50 apartments available. Additional apartments can be added at node stage 4 if there is an available plot for expansion. Different types of apartments can also be added, such as penthouses. At the metropolis stage, depending on the number of upgrades the mayors of the node have chosen, the maximum number of apartments available to the node could be in the low hundreds. The price of these apartments will vary based on the number of apartments being sold, and again, the more sold, the higher the price will be to help throttle the number of citizens for each node. Different sizes and layouts of apartments might have different prices as well. Not a lot is known about apartment benefits yet, but the benefits will be lower than freehold and in-node housing benefits. There might be some planting via pots in apartments and some functional furniture items. Freeholds are the next housing type and are considered the highest tier of housing, and players are limited to owning only one per account. A lot more is known about them after last year's big livestream on freeholds. These are sizable housing plots that are approximately 1.5 acres in size and roughly 100 meters by 60 meters. Freeholds can be customized with many different building types and are placed in estates within baronies within the ZOI of a stage 3 or higher node, including the ZOI of any vassal nodes. Expansions and upgrade options for freeholds become available as the attached node progresses. Baronies are large, designated swaths of land. Each stage 3 or higher node will have multiple baronies and more will become available as the node levels. Baronies are used exclusively for the freehold and guild hall systems. In each barony will contain a maximum of one guild hall and multiple freeholds. Guild halls owned by the guilds that have patron status with an attached node may have the ability to confer benefits to surrounding estates by specking into passives in their guild skill tree and carrying out a lengthy questline. Freeholds require a bound deed from the parent village or higher node in order to place the plot. These are acquired through a completion of a lord's quest to ascertain worthiness for lordship over an estate. This quest requires level 50, the max player level, and this could change based on feedback during testing. There will be more deeds than estates as anyone can complete the quest, but there are a limited number of estate plots available on each server. Deeds may only be used to place a freehold if the deed holder successfully wins a freehold auction for an estate. Citizens and non-citizens can bid on these estates, and winning the freehold estate would allow a non-citizen to have node housing and therefore become a citizen. These freehold auctions happen at a regular cadence. This cadence is system-driven and cannot be affected by mayors or any other players. Some freehold estate auctions will require node-type specific bound currencies, but the majority will auction for gold. 
This is intended to cater to players with many different play styles who are progressing through alternate systems. A deed holder who has won an estate auction can claim an estate from within a barony in that node ZOI, including the ZOI of any vassal nodes. Placement of the plot is achieved by using the deed in the player's inventory to get a top-down view of the estate, and then selecting the desired location for the freehold plot within that estate. The manipulation and orientation of the plot can be changed before placement. Once placed, players will then get an empty freehold plot with a shed to store materials to start building out the various buildings on the freehold. Freehold plots cannot be placed near any roadways, dungeons, event spawn areas, or within 100 meters of any other freehold. Higher level nodes will have more freehold estates available to bid on. Freeholds provide a lot of benefits, the biggest of which is freeholds are where the highest tier processing occurs at the master and grandmaster level, or level 30 and higher processing. Housing is also available, and there are three different sizes of houses on freeholds. There are freehold businesses that players can place, which allow players to sell items, consumables, and services to players. Freehold buildings do have their own skill tree upgrade paths. Lower tier gathering plots can be placed on freeholds as well. The three main buildings that can be placed on a freehold are homesteads, artisan buildings, and business buildings. These buildings require the ownership of blueprints and applicable materials to construct. The freehold owner will need to purchase a permit for each building on the freehold from the attached node and there may be an ongoing fee to maintain that permit. The number of freehold building permits issued will determine the tax rate for the freehold as well. Currently, freeholds have a maximum of six artisan and business buildings that can be placed in addition to the homestead building. When placing a building, players will be able to manipulate the orientation of the building. Players can rename their buildings. Building skins can also be applied after the building is placed. There are in-game achievable building cosmetics as well. There are some that came with the pre-order packs, and there will be more that will be purchasable from the cosmetic-only cash shop in the future. The shed that first appears on the plot can be used to store materials needed to construct the buildings. Some freehold buildings have multiple tiers with different sizes. Upgrading a building's tier will not change the size of the building in terms of footprint, but may increase its height. Owners of freeholds are allowed to resell their freeholds to other players. The seller of a freehold can choose to list their freehold as an auction or sell it directly to another player. The buyer must have completed the freehold quest to purchase a freehold. The amount of freeholds available on a server in total is said to be in the low thousands. With a planned registered player cap per server of 50,000, that means that less than 10% of players will be able to own a freehold at any given time on a server. Which is part of the design of Ashes that I mentioned very early in this video, not everyone will get everything in this MMO. However, there is the possibility for freehold plots to be recycled after the node they are attached to is successfully sieged, though it is not a guarantee as there is a one week grace period where a new node ZOI can take over the freehold plot and it is not destroyed. A freehold can also be lost by the player if they become delinquent on taxes similar to in-node housing. All housing has a permission system attached to it where players can set permissions for many different aspects of the housing plot. Freehold owners can utilize the family and guild systems to grant access to various aspects of the freehold, whether it be harvesting crops, using processing stations, using storage containers, or even giving full permissions that in essence makes someone a co-owner and able to make major changes to the freehold. The family system normally has eight members, but it can increase to nine with marriage and all of them can be allowed to access a freehold if the owner chooses. In addition, a percentage of the owner's guild or battalion, which is a microstructure within a guild, can also access the freehold in the same way. With the permission system, a large percentage of players will likely be able to access a freehold in some capacities, despite only a small percentage of players being able to own one. PvP is disabled in the homestead on the freehold, which is one of the very few places that are PvP free in the entire game. And that is it for freeholds and player housing. Now on to node governments. The mayor is the primary leader of a node, but there are many other leadership positions in a node that are attained through seasonal titles such as leaders of in-node temples, social organization leaders, patron guild leaders, and chief bounty hunters. 
Once a node reaches stage 3, there is a one-week cooldown before node elections begin. After the election is over, there is a one-month cadence on re-elections. Each citizen will get a notice mailed to their account notifying them of the election. Only node citizens may be elected mayor. Each node type has a different election style. Divine node mayors are elected based on the citizen who earns the most PvE favor with the node. Most of the devotion-oriented tasks are going to be on an individual basis and won't utilize outside support. Economic node mayors are elected via blind bid auction where the citizen bidding the most money wins. This is a gold sink and that gold is not used by the node. Military node mayors are elected via trial by combat. During the election week, the node will enter an open PvP battleground state for an hour-long period where candidates and their supporters compete to earn points by securing objectives. The highest point getter at the end of the week will win the election. Scientific node mayors are elected via a ranked choice popular vote wherein players list their preferred candidates in order on the ballot. Being a mayor on paper looks to be a highly involved process because like everything in Ashes, it's complicated. Mandates are the energy system used by mayors in order to take actions in a node. Citizen participation in policy votes, construction, mayoral commissions, mayoral caravans, node wars, and node sieges all generate mandates that the mayor can then use for all sorts of things within the node system which we'll get into shortly. New mayors start with a few mandates available, and any left at the end of their term will be lost. There is no cap on the amount of mandates a player can have, however, there are only so many ways to generate mandates that a mayor has at their disposal, so in essence, there is a soft cap to how many mandates a mayor could have. There are many different potential powers that mayors have. Some require the use of mandates or node commodities or gold from the node treasury. In order to reduce this video length by a bit, I'm just going to scroll them on the screen for you or you can go check the wiki page. In short, things like declaring a node war, adjusting the tax rate, improving node defenses in the event of a war, entering trade agreements with other nodes, and launching mayoral caravans as part of these trade agreements, proposing node policies to be voted on by by citizens setting buy orders to generate node commodities that are needed to construct node buildings, and starting mayoral commissions which have many different rewards that improve the node are some of the bigger powers of a mayor. We will expand upon most of these functions throughout the rest of the video. Mayors get more powers and responsibilities as a node advances. Some powers are specific to node types, biomes, or dominant races, and some are universal. Mayors have some control over the layout of the node as they can determine what constructible node buildings are built and in which open plots they are built. One of the bigger duties of a mayor is the node commodity system and the buy orders that mayors can initiate to generate said node commodities. These node commodities can then be spent by the mayor on construction, updates, and maintenance of node service buildings. Players can fill these buy orders using raw materials or crafting materials, but not final goods. The mayor chooses which materials he wants for the order and the amount of the materials needed to fill the order, and the time the order will be available for, and adjusts the reward amount that players receive when filling the order. Players that fulfill these orders are rewarded with the node currency for that node type and increased to their reputation level in that node. Node citizens that participate in a buy order will generate mandates for their node mayor. If a mayor fails to set buy orders, buy orders will auto-populate after a set period of inactivity. Players will be able to see what buy orders are available at nodes around the world. Mayoral commissions are another major power of mayors. These are simple types of quests with singular objectives that the mayor initiates. Mayoral commissions cost gold from the treasury to initiate. There are a limited number of mayoral commission slots available at any one time. Some commissions are distinct to node type, location, and other factors. Each player will have a cap on the amount of commissions they can accept at one time. Completing mayoral commissions awards the node with node commodities, node to node reputation, mandates, and temporary buffs to buildings or zones. Players when completing mayoral commissions are awarded experience, node reputation, node currency, and other rewards. Mayoral commissions can be completed by both citizens and non-citizens, though only citizens will generate mandate energy for the mayor. Mayoral commissions are similar to regular node commissions which are auto-generated by the node and enable characters and nodes to gain XP. 
Mayoral caravans are another major power of mayors. In order to start a mayoral caravan, there first must be a trade agreement in place with another node. A mayor can initiate a request for a certain node commodity that they are lacking. Another mayor from another node that has a trade agreement with that node can choose to fill that order, and if the receiving mayor accepts it, then a mayoral caravan will start. This is a system-driven caravan that will automatically spawn and move towards the node, and players can choose to defend it if they want. Trade caravans can initiate world events as well. Node policies are the next major mayoral power. These affect a variety of functions, including taxes and fees, building and zone-wide buffs, node-to-node -node reputation, trade agreements, and node wars. Mayors propose node policies that are voted on by citizens within a 24-hour or shorter time period. Policies are enacted if a majority of voters approve of the policy. American can use mandates to bypass voting on policies. Mayors can also take emergency actions if certain predicates are met. This allows them to reduce the voting threshold or voting time for policies. There are a limited number of policy slots available, and some policies fill multiple slots. Different policies are available based on node level, node type, events such as node wars and sieges, achievements the node has completed, world bosses the node has completed, node citizens gained or lost, and the node happiness level. Node happiness is a stat that changes based on many factors such as story arcs completed, bosses killed, new buildings being constructed, and a lot more. High levels of happiness unlock more policies. Low levels might disable certain NPCs or services within a node. Node Tax rates are another major mayoral power. Mayors can set a generalized tax rate, but over time as the node develops, they get more granular control over various aspects of taxation. With the ability to change the tax rate individually for things like crafting, commerce, amenities, and properties, Freehold tax rates do vary based on the number of freehold building permits that are issued. Citizenship dues and housing property taxes scale based on the stage of the node when a player becomes a citizen of the node. Earlier citizens get a lower tax rate, and later citizens get a higher tax rate, which is a method to throttle the population of a node. Tax rates will be visible on the world map by hovering over a node location. Node taxes only go towards funding node development and cannot be removed from the node system and used by players. Parent nodes do also take a cut of taxes from vassal nodes as well, but note that this does not increase the taxes for players and vassal nodes. To finish out the node government discussion, there is a city hall building that is pre-built into a node, and here the mayor can exercise the powers outlined earlier. City Hall will have a node board that anyone can interact with and get a list of citizens of the node and other details such as their guild, society, religion, and more. Moving on to node buildings, there are two types of node buildings. Default buildings that are automatically placed as a node levels and constructed buildings which mayors of the node can start projects to allow players to build. Constructed buildings are available in every node. Default buildings are the ones that vary based on node type. Further, there are also active and passive buildings. Active buildings allow players to interact with them and provide a service. Passive buildings simply provide passive benefits to the node or its zone of influence. Active service building types include artisanship, which is the gathering, processing, and crafting systems in the game. Business, content, and political buildings are all active building types. Passive building types include civic, cultural, and fabrication, scholarly, and vocational. Service buildings are upgraded by expansions, which are unlocked through the placement of passive service buildings. Building expansions unlock higher tier workstations at the cost of taking up another service building plot in the node. Node service building expansions unlock a tech tree for that building that can be used to provide upgrades to the active building as the node levels. Passive service building expansions can also allow a building to become specialized and unlock higher tiers of crafting. The example would be a blacksmithing station being upgraded to an armorsmithing station, then eventually to a building that specializes in plate armor. Doing this can make your node highly specialized and is why players will need to visit many different nodes to get access to stations and resources they need as not everything can be built in one node. These can even make vassal nodes very important as these smaller nodes could have a very specialized workbench that is not available elsewhere. Service buildings do incur a regular maintenance cost of node commodities and gold from the node treasury in order to continue operations. The list of currently known default service buildings is currently being shown on the screen. Constructible service buildings are placed by the mayor and an important thing to consider is that these do become objectives during sieges, events, and node wars, so placement location does matter for many different reasons. 
Mayors use the node commodity buy order system to generate enough node commodities to build these buildings. Once all the resources have been contributed, it will take anywhere from 15 minutes to a couple of days for the building to construct, depending on the type and tier of the building. A new mayor might decide to destroy a constructible node building, but this will come at the expense of mandates, and node citizens will have to approve this via a voting process. On the screen is a list of currently known constructible service buildings. Each node type has its own unique service buildings only available at that node type. On the screen is the list of known unique service buildings. The reliquary is available at every node and is a very important part of a node. It houses relics that grant passive and active benefits to node citizens and vassal node citizens. Relics are achievements for a node that unlock over time. Certain relics are needed to allow citizens to craft legendary items and to allow progress in certain legendary quest lines. Relics automatically manifest in the reliquary when specific conditions are met by that node. Many different progression paths are involved in new relics being created. For example, having a certain number of players achieving advanced stages of a certain artisan class could unlock a new relic for that node. There is even a constellation system that enables the acquisition of certain relics. Some relics can only be discovered through exploration. Events and even unsuccessful node sieges can damage node buildings and players will have to contribute materials to restore them. And buildings can even be destroyed as well via events, story arcs, node sieges, node wars, or atrophy. If a node siege is successful, all the buildings in a node are destroyed along with the entire node and rubble within the node buildings can be looted by anyone. The reliquary in particular will have the reliquary's contents and will likely be highly sought after for any relics players might desire. Moving on to node reputations, all players can gain or lose reputation with each bespoke node in ashes. This reputation applies to both citizens and non-citizens. Excessive negative reputation at a node can cause a character to be deemed an enemy of the state of a node. Negative reputation may even open up quest lines that others might not have access to. NPCs will react differently to players based on their reputation with the node or with factions within the node such as social organizations. Some node vendors might unlock at higher levels of reputation. Rarer commissions might unlock as well. Next, let's talk about patron guilds. As said before, guilds do not own nodes. Instead, guilds can become a patron of a node. The amount of patron guilds within a node is limited by node stage. Metropolis nodes can have up to three patron guilds, cities can have two, towns can have one, and villages in lower do not have patron guilds. In order for a guild to earn patron status, it simply has to be the guild that contributes the most amount of work to a node. Benefits of becoming a patron guild include emblems that can be applied to guild armor, participation in the node's stock market, ability to participate in guild-based missions that will progress the guild's leveling and development, allocation of guild points to unlock specific node abilities for guild members, the ability to claim an in-node guild hall, these in-node guild halls have different perks and benefits to the halls placed in baronies near freeholds. That covers patron guilds. Let's now talk about node sieges. Players can destroy nodes starting at stage 3 via node sieges. Sieging nodes will not be an easy task for the attackers. Cities and metropolises will have a considerable defensive advantage. As is the case for all of the structured opt-in PvP systems, in Ashes, the corruption penalty does not apply to node sieges. Mayors can allocate resources, taxes, and quests to bolster node siege defenses before the siege. These include things such as stronger walls and gates, traps, and siege equipment. Mercenary NPCs can also be hired to help defend. Relics the node has can offer area of effect buffs to damage, attack rage, or player health of the defenders. Node sieges can be declared by any player who completes the prerequisites for the siege initiation. Sieges are started via a siege scroll, which is acquired through a quest that scales in difficulty with respect to the level of the node. A substantial investment is required to attain the siege scroll. There is a cooldown of 21 days following a node advancing to a new stage where sieges cannot be declared. Siege scrolls are specific to the node that is named on the scroll, and the name cannot be modified. The lifetime of the scroll begins when a node is listed on the scroll. The mayor of a node is notified when their node is named on a siege scroll. After placing a name on the scroll, players will then have to take it to the node named on the scroll and activate it. Once the scroll is activated, the declaration period begins and a countdown is initiated for players in the region to see. 
countdown varies by node stage, and those times are listed on the screen. Sieging a node will require a similar amount of resources and time to what it took to develop the node being sieged. Siege equipment will need to be crafted based on the stage of the defending node. During the siege declaration period, individuals or guilds can register to attack or defend, providing they meet the criteria. The player who originally declared the siege cannot exclude anyone from joining the attack. Citizens of the node or provincial nodes being attacked are automatically registered as defenders. Players do not need to be citizens of the node in order to register as defenders, but they cannot be citizens of a node that is at war with the node they wish to defend. Citizens of allied nodes cannot register to attack. Many node services are shut down during the siege declaration period and instead are replaced by preparation quests or services for the siege. Once a siege is declared, players are prohibited from moving goods out of warehouses and other storage within the node. If a node gets enough XP to level during the declaration period, the level up will be delayed until after the siege. If a node survives the siege, it will then level up after the siege. Node sieges and other major PvP events in Ashes happen during server prime time. This is a window between 3 and 9 p.m. server time. When a siege begins, temporary alliances are formed among attackers and defenders. There are many incentives to participating in a node siege as an attacker or defender besides just the end objective. Things such as titles, items, materials, and gold are all potential incentives. As for the siege itself, it is said to be open world. Players that are registered can respawn in the siege area. Players that are not might have to respawn much further away from the siege area. The goal for castle sieges is 250 versus 250 at a minimum and up to 500 versus 500 maximum. It is assumed the same applies to node sieges, though they have never specified numbers for node sieges. A node siege occurs over several phases. Some siege mechanics might be instanced and gated for certain group size during the siege. Siege weapons and siege vehicles will be available to use during sieges. Siege equipment is able to be crafted or purchased from certain NPCs. There will be ways to repair destructible structures and repair siege weapons that were damaged during sieges. Siege NPCs, NPC guards, and mercenary NPCs serve as defense points during sieges and other events. Only combat NPCs are killable during a siege. Non-combat NPCs will despawn during the siege. Dragon flying mounts are extremely rare flying mounts that can be used during sieges. These have AoE breath attacks, flyby attacks, and other abilities. These flying mounts will have a lot of capabilities in large-scale PvP. These mechanics haven't been talked about for a long time, so it's possible they are no longer a part of the design intent for Ashes. The Crude Summons have been talked about as a special mechanic during sieges, which are activated by a party leader with that ability along with additive components from other classes that are a part of that group. A few examples given were the summoner archetype being able to group together to create a massive golem summon in a siege. Another siege summon that has been mentioned is tanks having a giant wall that they can summon as a group. As for the final objectives of a siege, node sieges last two hours. Attackers will need to gain access to the node, then reach a central point where they must channel a five-minute cast on the defender's flag. This cast cannot be interrupted by CC, but can be interrupted through the death of the caster. Defenders will be required to hold the central point in the node for the duration of the siege, or they can destroy the headquarters of the attackers to end the siege early. If the node survives, there will be a cooldown before a node can be sieged again. These cooldowns are shown on screen. If the node survives, citizens will need to obtain the resources needed to rebuild any damaged infrastructure. If the node is destroyed, players will lose their node citizenship. Normally, if someone rescinds their node citizenship, there is a cooldown before someone can become a citizen of another node, but not in the case of their home node being destroyed in a siege. After a node is destroyed in a siege, the footprint of the node will enter a rune state and become an open PvP zone for a number of days equal to the node's level. These runes consist of a debris field of treasures that are lootable by certain players. The list of potential lootables based on node building type is shown on screen. Freeholds under the purview of the Fallen node may be attacked with materials and resources being lootable on the Freehold for a period of two hours following a successful siege against its parent node. Players and their allies can defend their Freehold during this time. Freehold owners can hire NPCs and build defensive structures to help defend during this time as well. 
After the two-hour period of open combat, the freehold is allowed to exist with a grace period of one week where another node may take over the zone of influence of the freehold. The freehold owner will be required to undertake a quest to have their freehold adopted by this new node. At the end of the grace period, if a new node's ZOI has not overtaken the freehold, it will be destroyed. After the rune state expires based on the timer, the node reverts back to a stage 0 node and can be leveled up again. That covers node sieges and what happens when a node is destroyed in a siege. The final topic on nodes is underwater nodes, coastal island nodes, and underrealm nodes. There are not underwater nodes. There are, however, nodes on coasts and in the underrealm. Nodes on the coasts and islands have some special functionality reserved for those nodes, such as ocean-based quest lines and services. Coastal nodes, as they develop, can change the spawn tables of ocean content, just as fully land-based nodes can do with surrounding land. Coastal nodes are not directly siegeable by the sea, but there will be some naval objective gameplay during sieges at these nodes. The first coastal nodes to reach stage 3 in an area will take control of the nearest harbor. Harbors have a significant influence on the waters. Merchant ships, which are very large trade ships similar to caravans on land, but much larger in capacity, can only be launched from harbors. All their player-owned ships can only be crafted and upgraded at harbor ship workstations that are unlocked as these harbor nodes advance. Advance. Finally, we have Underrealm nodes. These have the same functionality as above ground nodes, and Underrealm nodes can reach the max level of stage 6, and they can have vassal chains that extend above the ground. Any ZOI of an Underrealm node that overlaps nodes above ground is considered adjacent and not overlapping. With nodes finished, let's talk about combat. Combat is a very important factor for a lot of players. Ash's combat historically has been said to be a hybrid combat that blends action and tab, however, as we've gotten a lot of combat showcases in the last two years, the combat does appear to lean more towards tab than it does action. In my opinion, the combat system that most closely resembles Ashes is Guild Wars 2, which most people would consider a tab system with some action elements. There are also elements of Arcage with the debuff promotion system and some elements from action MMOs added like active blocking and dodging. Like Guild Wars 2, there are two camera modes, an action mode that uses a reticle to select targets, somewhat similar to the way ESO operates although you can still use tab to hard lock onto targets in the action camera mode. And there is the additional tab target mode. Action style abilities do exist and are in the form of template based attacks that are not hard locked with the tab target system, just like in Guild Wars and frankly a lot of tab target MMOs. All melee abilities have a forward cone attack and will cleave multiple targets just like in Guild Wars 2. Melee abilities utilize a split body root motion system wherein larger weapons will slow down the player more than smaller weapons do, but no matter what there is very little rooting in place while using abilities in Ashes except for big impacting abilities like the Ranger snipe ability. Expanding a little bit upon the player synergy system, which is the ability combo system in use in Ashes, which is very similar to the debuff promotion system from Arcage. There are many skills that apply debuffs. If another skill that applies the same debuff is used on a target that already has that debuff in place, the debuff is promoted to a stronger debuff. We have seen many examples of these debuff promotions between the Cleric, Ranger, Mage, and Tank showcases in the last two years. Individual players can promote debuffs on their own utilizing their class kit, or these promotions can happen via interplay between classes in a group. One example is a fighter doing a whirlwind skill which applies the stagger effect, and then a cleric placing down a chains of restraint ability which also applies stagger or stuns if a stagger is already on a target. Active blocking and dodging is planned to be a feature for every archetype in Alpha 2 and will be iterated upon based on testing. The developers are considering tying active blocking to either mana or a new resource such as stamina. Shields are more effective for active blocking, but all melee weapons can actively block to some extent. Active dodging will not provide invincibility frames to players, meaning they will have to time their dodges correctly for them to function correctly. Some stronger abilities might be able to overcome an active block. Sprinting is also a mechanic that can be used outside of combat but does consume mana. Ashes does not have auto attacks like a lot of tab target MMOs have, instead that is replaced by the weapon combo system. 
In Ashes, all classes can use any weapon, and each has its own basic weapon combo which can be changed via talents in the weapon combo skill tree. The default key to start the weapon combo is Q or mass left click in action camera mode. Using any skill during the weapon combo chain will interrupt the chain and start it over should you begin using it again. The weapon combo system is designed to have synergies with class kits to create further build diversity and unique playstyles. Like most MMOs, things like crowd control skills, crowd control break abilities, and diminishing returns on crowd control are all a thing. Animation cancelling, which is found in MMOs like ESO, where players could cancel an ability slightly early in order to boost DPS, is not a planned mechanic for Ashes Combat. That does not mean players can't cancel abilities early, and you're not locked into that ability, but cancelling early will not allow the skill to finish and will activate some kind of cooldown on the ability, even if it is not a full cooldown. AoE is of course a part of combat, and player collision is the mechanism that is the AoE cap. Friendly and enemy player collision is a thing in Ashes and will not allow players to exist in the same area at one time. Projectile collision is also a mechanic in Ashes. Projectiles, if they collide with any object before getting to their target, will not damage the intended target. They will not home through walls and lock on like in most ab MMOs. Players in PvP will not know granular details of enemies in combat. You will not see health and mana levels, instead you see multiple blocks on the health bar that degrade as the player takes damage. There is planned to be information such as the type of armor being worn, the tier set of the armor, visual effects might reveal enchantments on the gear, and class will be shown. However, inspecting players is not planned, only some details of players will be shown via the UI. Add-on support and things like damage meters are not planned for Ashes. Threat mechanics in Ashes operate based on a traditional threat table, but threat meters are not going to be available. Instead, threat levels might be known more through in-game visual clues that indicate threat levels. Balance of classes in Ashes is group-focused and not focused on 1v1s. 1v1 matchups will have a rock-paper-scissors dynamic where some classes are super superior to others. In terms of meta gameplay, the goal of the developers is to emphasize micro metas that work for specific encounters instead of macro metas that work for everything. Some gear, class, or skill setups might be optimal for some encounters but not all encounters. This dynamic does create a horizontal gear chase as the dynamic world shifts based on nodes that level or are destroyed and thereby open new content. Naval gameplay is a huge aspect of Ashes as well. Naval content includes all the following things listed on the screen. Naval content is not slated to be an Alpha 2 testing at the start, but will be added as an update. Three ship classes will be present in the Alpha 2 once they add naval. Naval NPCs exist in and around oceans. There are sailing NPCs, NPC fortresses, NPC frigates or galleon ships, raid bosses, quest NPCs, and other general sea-based NPCs. Players that participate in naval gameplay via ships can progress in their Mariner class skills, but these are skill trees that are arranged in a similar manner to Arzen class skill trees. As a player gains Mariner experience and allocates points into these trees, they will become more adept as a Mariner. Some examples of skills that players can improve via the Mariner system are interactions with ship attachments such as gunnery, piloting the ship, ship navigation, sail management, ship repair, defensive skills, and utility skills. Ships are built by players who possess the correct components, recipes, and are at an advanced enough node that contains a harbor. The individual ship components are created by different professions in the artisan system. These individual components are assembled by players in special harbor ship workstations that are unlocked as coastal harbor nodes progress. Players can choose which joints get populated with either offensive or defensive weaponry or other defensive or utility attachments. The types of attachments available does vary by ship class. Some ship weapons are projectile based and will require leading a target. Some, like harpoons, are fast projectiles that impact within a second or two. Instead of cannons, ships will use potion launchers that fire very slow projectiles that can take three to five seconds to impact the target. Ships can be damaged and get repaired as well. Ships can have status effects and debuffs such as a burning status effect. Ship owners can set permissions for other players to use some parts of the ship or even drive the ship. Players will get access to a basic ship at a very early level of around 10 to 15. 
Ships are divided into different classes. There are small, medium, and large ships. Small ships include personal vessels which have a crew size of 1 to 3. Medium ships include frigates with a crew size of 8. And large ships include galleons that can accommodate an entire 40-man raid and can tackle naval raid content. In addition to those ships, there are also merchant ships. These are essentially the caravans of the seas as their carrying capacity is much larger than a caravan. Fishing boats are also planned to be utilized for deep sea fishing. Normal caravans can convert to a raft as well, even on inland rivers. These caravans are able to transition to water at any point of intersection of land and water. All other ships can only be summoned from a port or a harbor. Players summon the ship from an item in their inventory. Ship navigation can be enhanced via navigational instruments such as spyglasses that can be attached on certain ship classes. These give an overview radar perspective of the area surrounding the ship with range based on the ship's class and type of instrument. The render distance of other ships on the water will vary based on the ship class and type of navigational instruments used on your ship. Winds will influence the speed and direction that ships travel on the open seas. Ships can participate in both PvP and PvE. Certain ship classes might be able to ram other vessels or even raid bosses. Ship weapons can damage both players and ships. Ship weapons do generate threat on bosses as well. Open sea or deep waters and ashes will automatically flag all players as combatants, meaning these are PvP free-for-all areas with no corruption penalties applied. Players will be notified when they enter these areas. This of course makes these areas more risky, but to compensate there will be better resources in these areas. In the coastal areas, PvP can still happen but it is subject to the same restrictions via the corruption flagging system. Or if guild wars are active in those cases, two opposing guilds would be allowed to attack each other outside of the corruption system. There is a guild castle in the middle of the map on a small island that can only be affected by naval gameplay. Naval Combat allows ships to be hijacked, destroyed, and looted, but it does not allow the attackers to permanently keep the ships. If a ship is destroyed, it will leave its crew stranded since ships can only be summoned from a port or harbor. There is no recall option to return to shore. Death by drowning is the only option to quickly return to the nearest respawn point on shore, but that will incur the normal death penalties. If the ship navigator is killed, there is a 15 to 20 minute period where any player can drive the ship before it despawns and becomes a wreckage. Merchant ships that are destroyed become wreckage that contains a portion of the cargo it was transporting. And that concludes the naval gameplay section. Now let's talk about the races of Ashes. Ashes has nine playable races. There are four parent races, each of which has two sub races and one race that is a hybrid of all the races. Instead of racial benefits tied directly to each race like in a lot of MMOs, Ashes instead uses backgrounds that players can select from during character creation to select what would be racial bonuses in other MMOs. This makes race choice purely aesthetic in Ashes. Races are not gender or class locked as well in Ashes. Race choice at character creation is a permanent choice and cannot be changed. Armor in the game will adapt the race model and take on its racial appearance. Weapons do not change based on race. Each race has a distinct artistic influence and those can be seen on screen. There are four divine portals in Vera, each of which is tied to one of the four parent races. However, players can choose to start at any divine gateway no matter their chosen race. Starting areas have small settlements that are not tied to the node system and are meant to acclimatize players to the game. Ashes does have plans to have one, if not the best, character creator in the MMO genre. The aim is for the character creator to be on par or better than the one in Black Desert Online. The plan is for a myriad of sliders and blending and sculpting features that are 100% developed in-house. Players will have the ability to save and share their characters they create. Through gameplay, players will be able to unlock some new features such as a new tattoo that unlocks by killing a certain raid boss. The number of character slots per account on launch is said to be a comfortable amount. During the Alpha 2 testing, it is said to be more limited. As for alts, progression pathways are per character. There is a sharing of storage space amongst all characters on an account. Gear can be transferred between all characters on an account as well via the shared storage. Multiple accounts are allowed in Ashes, but multi-boxing is not going to be allowed. 
As for factions and ashes, there are none. However, there are in essence pseudo-factions. These are temporary factions based on node citizenship, guild membership, and social organizations that players belong to, and the associated gameplays such as node and guild wars that accompany these systems. Moving on to classes and ashes, ashes has 64 class combinations. Players choose from a list of 8 primary archetypes at the start of the game. This archetype cannot be changed. The archetypes are as follows, Bard which is a support focused archetype, Cleric which is the main healer archetype, Fighter which is a melee DPS archetype, Mage a ranged DPS archetype, Ranger, a ranged DPS archetype. Rogue is a melee DPS archetype. Summoner is a highly versatile archetype that can fill multiple roles. Maybe not as the main healer or tank, but certainly as an off healer or tank. And finally tank, which is the main tank archetype. As you can see, Ashes does have the traditional Holy Trinity gameplay of tank healer, support, and DPS roles. To form your class at level 25, players again choose a secondary archetype from the same list of these 8 archetypes. On screen is a table with the names of each bespoke class. Unlike the primary archetype choice, the secondary archetype choice can be changed, but not on the fly. Instead, players will need to go to a specific location in a node to respect their secondary archetype, or things like their chosen class or weapon skill trees. Secondary archetypes only augment the skills of the primary archetype. Therefore, in reality, one way to look at the Ashes class system is that it only has 8 classes that are highly customizable. Skill augments are available from many different sources besides just the secondary archetype choice. Other sources include social organization augments, religious augments, and racial augments. Examples of augments are things like a mage secondary archetype choice offering a lot of teleportation augments to the primary archetype. For example, a fighter's charge ability might change from being a charge that takes some time to get to the target to a charge that is instant. Skill points are another way to customize your character. These can be used to level up archetype skills or weapon combo skills. There are active and passive trees for each archetype. Skill points accrue at certain milestones, currently that is one-fourth, one-half, and three-fourths of each level that a player will get a new skill point. Skill points can be used to unlock universal skills at the expense of unlocking class-specific skills. Respecting the skill points will have to be done at specific locations in nodes. Moving on to the map of Ashes, the Ashes of Creation world is known as Vera. The world is fully handcrafted by the developers, and the total size of the world is 1200 square kilometers, with around 750 square kilometers of ocean and 480 square kilometers of land. In addition to the 1200 square kilometer above ground map, there is an additional amount of space in the Underrealm of around 100 square kilometers. The travel time from north to south on each continent is roughly 75 minutes running and 50 minutes mounted. The rest of the estimated travel times are shown on screen. At the beginning of the game, players will start with the map covered in a fog of war. The world map is full of imperfect information which will require the player to travel to these locations to get more information. Some information about the world will be presented to players via the world map UI as it is gathered, things such as node tax rates by hovering over node locations, and things like player location markers that players in your party can place. Not every server will have the same map as different nodes are leveled and players complete different accomplishments on each server. The map is designed to have choke points that could be a natural funnel for caravans. Moving on to zones, zones can refer to many different things in Ashes. You have the nodes zone of influence, different biomes, castle regions, economic regions, and points of interest. Ashes does not have the typical zones of theme park MMOs that contain content of a set level range. Instead, Ashes zones will have content tailored to all levels. The higher the nodes in a zone, the more high level content will unlock. As for biomes, Ashes is said to have 18 different biomes. Ashes has 5 guild castles. Each guild castle has a castle region that covers one fifth of the world, and unlike nodes zone of influence, these castles regions are static and not fluid. Economic regions are another static area defined by geographic points of interest. 
Castle regions are said to be larger than economic regions and encompass many economic regions. Each castle region does impose a tax on the entire region, which is separate from node taxes. Points of interest include things like dungeons, world bosses, and corrupted areas. New points of interest can spawn as nodes develop, and existing POIs can evolve and adapt to node growth. Additional buildings and mobs might spawn in a point of interest. New story arcs and quest lines might appear. The difficulty might increase. Some dungeons will only unlock when nodes hit a certain stage. Multiple nodes might collectively influence some POIs. Some dungeons will expand and unlock new content as nodes develop. Drop tables might change as well. POI locations are static and in the same area on each server, but not every server will have the same POIs unlocked based on node development. The map is massive and there is very limited fast or instant travel in Ashes. The few fast travel options that exist are scientific metropolises which offer teleportation within their vassal network and the family summon system. These instant teleportation options do not allow players to teleport with materials in their backpack, as that would bypass the caravan system which is the main method for moving large quantities of materials from node to node. The family system is normally limited to 8 players, but can be increased to 9 if the head of the family gets married. A character may only belong to one family at a time, and leaving a family will trigger a cooldown. There are costs associated with family creation and maintenance, some of which are shared and some of which are paid by the head of the family. Freeholds are intended to work with the family system. Marriages are a thing in Ashes. Same-sex marriages are allowed. Marriage could unlock new content not available to characters that are not married. The family summon mechanic is a long duration cast with a long cooldown that slowly summons each of your family members to your current location. Players cannot be summoned if they are in combat, corrupted, or engaged in any type of event, or if they have raw materials or certificates in their possession. Outside of the scientific metropolis instant travel system, this is the only teleportation system in Ashes. In addition to instant travel, which is very limited, there are plenty of faster travel options. Options, player ridden land mounts, gliders, aquatic mounts, and in some rare cases even flying mounts might be available. Public transportation via public land transports and flight points between certain nodes will also be available. Some metropolis nodes might be able to be linked via airships. In the past this was said to only be between scientific metropolises. Recent comments suggest this might be available between all metropolis nodes. Also roads exist and are both pre-generated and player influenced. The largest roads are referred to as arteries. These are the remnants of what was once the ancient highway system of Vera. As nodes advance, smaller roads, referred to as veins, connect the arteries to the nodes. At higher levels of node advancement, capillary nodes will stem off the node to connect major points of interest. Roads can be improved and upgraded via node building upgrades, policies, relics, and the level of nearby nodes. Seasons and events can affect access to various roads. Pathways that are open during summer may be closed during winter. Seasonal effects and weather such as snow could temporarily block certain areas. Water could turn to ice in the winter and allow land travel over areas that are not available in summer. Caravan events can spawn some events that cause roadways to be blocked or NPC events to trigger. Caravan components can be utilized to improve the speed of caravans both on and off-road. The mount system is planned to be extremely extensive in ashes. Mounts are accessible very early on via a quest in the starting area. There are three tiers of mounts, ground mounts, gliding and jumping mounts, and royal flying mounts. Aquatic mounts are also classified as a tier A mount. Aquatic mounts are faster in water than they are on land, and land mounts are faster on land than water. Flying mounts or royal mounts are very rare in Ashes. Each server will have a maximum of between 10 to 20 royal mounts. Royal mounts are available to node mayors and kings or queens of each of the five guild castles. Royal mounts can also drop from legendary world bosses. Different tier mounts have different abilities that are unique to that tier. These abilities could provide horizontal or vertical power gains. Mounts have up to four abilities including speed boosts, offensive and defensive abilities. Mount abilities are unlocked via the animal husbandry profession, which is a processing profession within the artisan system. Taming via the hunting gathering profession is where the base creatures will come from to feed the animal husbandry profession. Mounts will have rarities that are either bred or acquired. These rarities might influence mount skills and visual effects. Some mounts might be best suited as initiation vehicles, escape vehicles, utility vehicles, or traversal vehicles. Some mounts might be great for jumping or even 
and double jumping, some might be best on certain terrain types, and of course gliding as well. Mounts will have varying speeds, and finding the best speeds might take trial and error with the animal husbandry system, just like min-maxing any stat in the animal husbandry system. Mounts can be summoned in combat in most cases, and players can dismount their mount and keep it out in the open world. Mounted combat is a thing as certain mounts will have combat-related abilities. Players cannot, however, use their class skills while mounted. Mount skills will be based on mount breed, rarity, and some RNG. Example abilities are charging through opponents to knock them down, a lance type of weapon, or even group mounts with mounted weapons that passengers can use. Some crowd control abilities can dismount a player, and in that case, the mount persists in the world with its own health pool and stats. Mounts can be targeted and killed separately from players. There is a cooldown before a mount can be resummoned after it is killed. Fall damage while mounted will first be applied to the mount, and if it is enough to kill the mount, the player takes the rest of the damage. Mules are another mount type. These have inventory space that is roughly 10x what a player can carry. Like everything in Ashes, the animal husbandry system looks to be very complex with a full genetic system complete with dominant and recessive genes and a ton of mount traits that players can discover using this system, some of which are currently on screen. Animal husbandry is conducted at stables on freeholds. Stables can also store mounts for future use. Since we recently talked about map size, let's quickly talk about server capacity. The world map of Ashes is huge, but the server capacity is also very high as well. Concurrent numbers are expected to be 8 to 10k per server. Initially, the plan is to limit the number of registered accounts per server to 15k, but increase that over time to 50k per server. Ashes will not have separate PvE and PvP servers as the game is built around PvX. Moving on to weather, climate, and seasonal systems in Ashes. Some biomes will have fixed climates and some will have variable climates. Weather effects will change during each season. Some events can trigger dynamic weather in specific areas of the map where that event takes place. Or an event can extend the season for an entire biome or shorten it. Some abilities and also professions may be enhanced or hindered during certain climates and seasonal weather events. For example, an ability that uses lightning might be stronger in rain. Frost bolts might be stronger in colder conditions. Weather can affect mob spawning, side quests, gatherables, vehicles, mounts, ships, resistances, targeting, and boss mechanics. Access to dungeons and raids might even be hindered by changes in climate. Some weather conditions can be hazardous to mobs and players. Seasons affect different zones based on their location in the world. A majority of environments will experience two or four seasons, excluding corrupted areas which are considered their own season. There will even be magical seasons and weather where a tropical area might experience winter. Each season will be one or two IRL weeks long. They might be shorter or longer based on dynamic events in the world. Seasonal resources are a thing in ashes as well. Some materials only exist in cold climates or winter such as gloomy pros. Others are only available during summer and others can only be found in corrupted areas. Seasons affect crops and other resources that can be planted. Crop rotations are affected by the seasons as well. There is also a day and night cycle in Ashes. Day and night cycles occur over the course of a few hours and are tied to server time. Some resources can only be gathered during the day or at night, such as night opals. Some might even only be available at specific times of the night or day. Embassies and mobs might react differently during day and night cycles. At night, some mobs might be asleep, but awake during the day. Some mobs will only spawn during either day or night. Constellations are a part of the night sky. These rotate through the sky during the nighttime. Constellations may only be seen at specific times and specific locations in the world, and they have relevance for multiple game systems such as story, acquiring relics for nodes, empowering certain items or abilities, and exploration. Winds also exist as a weather element and also affect ship speed and direction on the open seas. Moving on to the Underrealm, this is a rich environment where bioluminescence abounds in the flora and fauna that are present there. The Underrealm is estimated to be not bigger than 100 square kilometers in area. It is not contiguous across the 
the entire map. Instead, the Underrealm will provide alternate pathways to natural above ground choke points. Not all entrances to the Underrealm will be available at all times. The entrances available will change based on the world state. There will be bodies of water in the Underrealm that offer unique species of fish, but there will not be boats in the Underrealm. Mounts can be used in the Underrealm, and even flying mounts can be used due to how large the Underrealm is. Seasons and weather above ground might affect the Underrealm, such as flooding of tunnels in the Underrealm. Caravans can operate here, and in some cases they might be the better path to take. The Underrealm will have different gathering resources than above ground as well. Nodes do exist in the Underrealm, and while above ground node zones of influence might overlap, they are considered adjacent and not within the same zone of influence. Node sieges can occur with these nodes as well, and Underrealm nodes can actually reach the highest stage of Metropolis. The Tolnar race is native to the Underrealm. And now we are ready for the next major topic of Ashes, the economy. Ashes has a heavily player-driven economy, much more so than in the currently popular theme park MMOs. The economy of Ashes is designed to be regional. Prices may vary based on location and supply and demand in that region. The reason for this is there is no central global auction house, there is no fast transportation of materials and some materials will spawn more frequently in some areas of the world. There will be population-based scaling of NPC-sold items based on the economic activity of the server. Prices will rise to combat inflation and fall as population diminishes. Gold will be generated in a unique way in Ashes. Most mobs will not drop gold, instead they will drop glint that must be turned in at hunting lodges in exchange for glint commodities which can be sold for gold. Glint is a bound currency that drops from mobs and players and is offered as a reward for completing certain quests, events, and achievements. Glint is intended to be the primary gold generation method in Ashes. Glint has six different rarities, the same rarities that items and materials have, legendary through common with color coding of each tier. Rarity of Glint that drops increases with mob level. Glint occupies space within the spatial inventory system that Ashes uses for player material storage in their backpack. It is not just a number in a ledger. If needed to transport large quantities of glint, players will need to use caravans. Upon death, players will drop a percentage of their glint, which varies based on what their current state is in the corruption PvP flagging system. This dropped glint becomes stolen glint that other players can loot. Glint in caravan wreckages is also classified as stolen glint. Stolen glint is not bound like regular glint and can only be turned in at nodes that have a black market building built as an expansion to their marketplace, which not all nodes will, and the value is less than the original value of the glint. Glint can also be used to pay housing taxes and citizen dues. It can also be stored in node warehouses for future use. To convert Glint to gold, players will need to purchase player commodities at hunting lodges in nodes. They can then sell these commodities for gold at that location or take these commodities to another node to increase the value. The further these commodities are taken, the higher the value is. In the first Caravan livestream, the example showed a roughly 5x return to take these commodities just from one node to the nearest node. There is also some variation in values based on how much of a certain commodity is being turned in at that node. A lot of turn-ins equals less gold value, less turn-ins equals more gold value. Player commodities can be transported as cargo on caravans just as node commodities and regular materials and resources can. Caravans use crates which utilize a spatial inventory system. Ashes has a lot of item and gold sinks planned. Anything that can be crafted can also be destroyed. One of the few ways this can happen are via over enchanting which has a chance to destroy the item. Players can salvage finished items themselves and this is the only method to gain certain craftable items and recipes which encourages salvaging and keeps lower tier crafted items relevant. A portion of resources and materials are lost when caravans or nodes are destroyed. Corrupted players who die can lose gear. Item durability is a material sink. It will take some of the materials that were needed to craft the item to repair it. Allowing an item to go to zero durability will increase the repair cost and render it unusable. Player trading is done via several methods simple player-to-player -player trading or through player stalls, player shops, or auction houses. 
Player stalls can be rented at locations near the unique building in an economic node or in marketplaces built within a node. An attendant NBC is assigned to the stall. The player does not need to be present to sell goods within a player stall. The storage for a player stall is linked to the player's warehouse in that node. The listings are posted on bulletin boards in the region and possibly even in the auction house. Player stalls are one of the very few PvP safe zones in the game as well. Personal shops are acquired by players by purchasing a placement certificate. They can then build them on their freeholds or near the unique node building in a node. Or if the node is an economic node and a metropolis, they can be placed anywhere in the world. Players must be present and online at these shops to sell goods, and the listings are tied to the player's inventory. PvP is allowed in player stalls with applied corruption penalties enabled. Personal shops and player stalls are considered a form of player-run business. In this case, they are in-node businesses. There are several player-run businesses available on freeholds as well, such as taverns. These can provide services on the freehold without the owner being present. Taverns can also be placed in nodes as well. Auction houses are only available in economic nodes. Vassal nodes of the node that has the auction house can view items that are on sale, but unless the parent economic node is a metropolis, the vassal node citizens will still have to travel to the auction house to bid. Bulletin boards within player-run taverns or in nodes will display auction listings as well. Materials and gallerables won on the auction house will be deposited in the local node warehouse where listed and will need to be transported by the player wherever they need them. Finished items will be mailed to the player. Historical auction house data might be available via constructed node buildings. Integrated auctions that unlock when an economic node becomes a metropolis do allow players to purchase items directly from the linked auction houses in the vassal nodes. As for normal player-to-player -player mailing, it is still being discussed by developers whether or not players will be able to mail finished items to each other. While raw materials cannot be mailed, regular text mail will be instantly delivered to a player. As for currencies in Ashes, gold is the general in-game currency, with gold, silver, and copper making the full list of coins. There are several bound and progression-based currencies as well, including glint, and a different currency tied to each of the four node types, for example, honor at military nodes and favor at divine nodes. Node currencies are used to purchase venerable items within those nodes as long as the player has the requisite node reputation, and in divine nodes, favor is used to buy the mayorship. Node currencies have also been discussed as a potential way to bid on freeholds in some node types. Religions, social organizations, and possibly even tavern games might have their own bound currencies. There will be very little bound gear in Ashes. Most gear will still be tradable even after equipping it. Gear will be acquired primarily via crafting, with small chances of finished items dropping from raid and dungeon bosses. But the primary way to acquire the best gear in the game is from crafting. With crafting mattering, that makes the gathering and processing matter a lot as well, and should make the economy of Ashes very very robust. Stock exchanges are a planned feature of the economy of Ashes. These are places where players can buy and sell shares in nodes, guilds, or social organizations. The value of these shares will vary based on the progression of these various organizations. Sieges will halt the trading of shares until the siege ends. That covers the economy of Ashes, now let's talk about the system that is heavily tied into the economy and progression systems of the game, the Artisan System. The artisan system encompasses the gathering, processing, and crafting systems. Within each of these artisan classes lies different individual professions. As of now, there are 22 different professions in total. Artisan progression starts at level 1 and goes to level 50. Level 1 through 10 is novice, and level 40 to 50 is grandmaster. Players can become a grandmaster in any two professions. It used to be said that you could only be a grandmaster in two professions within one of the three arts and trees. That has been changed, and now you can be a grandmaster in any two professions no matter the tree. It will not be possible to achieve Grandmaster in a profession at a low character level. Players can also achieve Master level in one additional profession, three total including the two Grandmaster professions. And players can reach a Journeyman in one additional profession, so four total including the three Master professions. And players can reach Apprentice in one additional professions for a total of five professions at the Apprentice level or higher. 
players can max out novice or level 10 in all 22 professions. Players start the game as a novice in all 22 professions. Progression to each tier grants skill points that can be utilized in a character's artisan skill tree. Artisan certification quests must be completed to move to each new tier of artisan progression. Completing certification unlocks benefits for that profession such as artisan tools for gathering professions and recipes for crafting professions. Grandmaster Artisans will get enough skill points to max out their entire profession skill tree. Skill trees will have specialized paths that focus on one area of that profession. This encourages player interdependency. Progression of artisan skills does grant the player as well as the node experience. Artisan gear can be acquired that can boost a player's artisan skills. There are three artisan gear slots in the character paper doll. Players can toggle whether adventuring gear or artisan gear is shown on the character model, but it does not affect the benefits of any equipped gear. Profession NPCs sell low level artisan gear. Gathering is the first artisan class, and in Ashes, most of the visible resources in the world are harvestable similar to games like New World. Gathering professions include fishing, herbalism, hunting, lumberjacking, and mining. The exact type of resource present within a node is not known until the node is harvested. Gathering requires the creation and use of tools, and you will need higher level tools for higher level gathering. Each profession has three gathering tools, each for different resource types. Players can make their own tools, they will not need to rely on others to create them. The developers are considering making gathering tools that require multiple players to use them but give increased rewards. Gathering tools and artisan gear both have stats that affect gathering rates and yields. Progression within a gathering profession can also affect rates and yields via skill point allocation. Tools do have durability and lifespans. Surveying is a system that can help gatherers identify what resources are available in a particular location. The exact details of how the system will work are not yet known, but what they have talked about is a surveying tool that is placed down and works within a radius of the tool. As players progress in their gathering profession, they might get more pylons they can place down to extend that radius. Some low-level gatherables have a tiered progression into higher-tier crafting. This gives value and need to lower-tier gatherables. There is also a resource quality system tied to gatherable materials similar to Star Wars Galaxies. The same type of resources will have different tiers of quality. Higher level artisan tree progression will unlock harvesting tools with a greater chance of collecting higher quality resources or proccing a greater quantity. Item and materials rarities in Ashes are shown on screen. There's also a land management system in Ashes. Players can affect the health of the land in both positive and negative ways. Overharvesting of one resource in an area might reduce its spawn rate. Removing an invasive species might improve the health of the land as well. Defeating certain raid bosses or mobs can also improve the health of the land. Processing is the second artisan class. It involves refining the gathered raw materials. Processing professions include alchemy, animal husbandry, cooking, farming, lumber milling, metalworking, stone stone masonry, tanning, and weaving. The bulk of the time spent in the artisan system resides in the processing branch. The time to process varies based on the quality of the processed goods. Some processing can be carried out in nodes, but the best processing is done on player-owned freeholds. Node processing accommodates up to the journeyman level. Freehold processing accommodates master and grandmaster processing. Freehold processing stations can be upgraded over time via a building skill tree. From the freehold livestream, we saw an example of the lumber milling upgrade tree. As these upgrades are placed, there will be visual changes to the building in the world. These upgrade paths allow for specialization of the building which can be used to fill in gaps in a player profession skill tree or double down on areas the player is already proficient in. There will be some steps in processing that require player input which is a way to time gate processing times. Processing stations require fuel to process the required grade of materials. Players can mix and match different fuels to meet the fuel requirements. Processing stations have queue slots that allow jobs to be queued at the station. Processing jobs are processed sequentially for all players and freeholds. Processing jobs and nodes are processed sequentially per player, but concurrently with other players' jobs. The same processing animations and freeholds are visible to all players since there is a single processing queue. In nodes, players will only see animations related to those in their individual queue. The shared queue at freeholds is meant to throttle the processing at the master and grandmaster levels. 
Processing times, yields, queue times, and job sizes can increase based on node progression, service building upgrades, node policies, and relics. The developers are considering a decay mechanic for processing stations that would require repair similar to item decay for gear. Here's the list of processing stations we have seen so far. Crafting is the third and final artisan class in Ashes. It requires the acquisition of recipes in order to craft items. The crafting system of Ashes takes a lot of inspiration from Star Wars Galaxies crafting. Crafting professions include arcane engineering, armor smithing, carpentry, jewel cutting, leatherworking, scribing, tailoring, and weapon smithing. Crafting is recipe-based in Ashes, not RNG-based. Recipes when obtained can be added to the player's recipe book by right-clicking them. Players will need to have the requisite artisan certification to be able to learn the recipe. Recipes can be traded or sold before they are used. Some recipes might have a charge count that allows them to be used multiple times. Recipes can be obtained in a multitude of ways, including from profession NPCs, from vendors, trading with other players, drops from mobs and world bosses, reputation rewards. Deconstructing rare item drops from bosses can yield recipes that created that item. Treasure hunting, social organization progression, religious organization progression, and repetition of specific game activities. Recipes do have different rarities and may be locationally dependent. And there is a recipe XP system in which crafting that recipe multiple times can level up the recipe and unlock better results. Recipes have slots for required and selectable crafting materials. Adding higher rarity selectable materials increases the rarity of the crafted item. Choosing different selectable materials can also change the stat block of the item or give it other unique properties. Crafting materials are obtained from the processing artisan class professions, world boss drops, and item deconstruction. On screen is the current current list of crafting material categories seen so far. World bosses will need to be farmed as they are the only source of some high-level materials, along with the deconstruction of high-level items. Crafting stations are located on freeholds or within nodes. Higher tier crafting stations are unlocked with node progression, and the highest tier of crafting stations are only available in nodes. Higher tier crafting stations unlock the ability to craft higher tier items. Stage 5 nodes may have just one Grandmaster Crafting Station. Stage 6 Metropolis nodes may have two Grandmaster Crafting Stations. Artisan gear will enable the crafting of stronger items. Crafting times might vary between professions, but the bulk of the time spent in the artisan system resides in the processing branch. The developers are considering using a crafting minigame that could increase the power of an item based on how well the player performs the minigame. Unlike arcades, there is no labor system that caps what a player can craft in a day. The artisan supply chain and regionalized economy play a big role in the artisan system. The caravan system plays a huge role in supplying processors with raw materials and crafters with processed materials. Raw materials are acquired by gathering, but also mob and boss skills and from deconstructing finished items. Bosses will drop materials that will be critical for some recipes, so bosses will still need to be killed to craft the best gear. Plus, some recipes will drop from bosses. Intrepid is planning to have a work order system to streamline players being able to find certain artisans in nodes. The inventory of a player is tied to their backpack. The backpack has three tabs labeled Inventory, Materials, and Quest Items. Completed items and consumables go in the Inventory tab, which uses the standard one-slot-for-one item system with no weight restrictions. There will be plenty of space for multiple gear sets and the ability to save gear set loadouts to quickly switch equipped gear. Inventory space can be upgraded by obtaining higher quality backpacks from crafters. There are multiple backpack slots that can be filled and different bags from different resources can be equipped. These backpacks will be more efficient for that resource type. For instance, a herbalism backpack will hold higher stack counts of herbs, but these backpacks can still hold other resources just less efficiently. When harvesting resources, they will be auto-placed in the best bag possible. Backpacks for regular inventory expansion are also planned. Some backpacks will also affect other stats like drop rates on death and PvP looting times. Players will need to have the applicable artisan certification to use certain artisan backpacks. On screen is the list of backpacks that have been seen so far. The quest tab is fairly straightforward. This is simply a place where quest items are stored to avoid them cluttering your inventory. 
The Materials tab operates differently from the regular Inventory tab. This uses a spatial Tetra-style inventory system. This spatial inventory system is intended to restrict how many raw materials a player can hold at one time in order to prevent over-harvesting of areas, and for players to have to return to drop off resources in a node more often, and to force the use of the Caravan system. Mules, of course, could be used to increase carrying capacity as they carry 10x what a player carries but mules can also be killed and drop a percentage of their materials. The Materials tab of the player's inventory is the only tab where upon death players will drop materials as players do not drop finished items. Depending on their flagging state in the PvP corruption system, this drop rate varies. Additional storage is found in node warehouses and player-created storage and housing areas. Sheds are storage areas found on empty freehold plots. Players can set permissions on their storage chests and freeholds and other housing areas. Node warehouses are default service buildings that come pre-built in each node. Completed items can be accessed by players at any node, whereas raw materials will only be accessible at the node they are stored at. As for gear and ashes, the gear is said to influence a maximum of 40-50% to 50 of a player's overall power level. So gear absolutely does matter in ashes. And remember, the best gear is made by crafters, and crafting will be by far the most reliable way to gear your character. Gear will also come from quests, drops, legendary bosses, guild tasks, favor, and other unique currencies, but again, the best gear comes from crafting. There are no stat requirements to equip gear, but there will be affiliation and level requirements. Some necessary crafting materials for higher tiers can only be obtained by salvaging lower tier gear, which keeps the lower tier crafting relevant throughout the course of the game. All Gear and Ashes is designed around the PvX nature of the game, and there will not be separate PvP and PvE gear. There is a large assortment of weapons in the game, and they offer different passive and proc effects from the weapon skill tree. On screen are the weapon types planned. Every class can use every weapon, and the weapons will operate the same on each class. There will not be different abilities on each weapon for each class like a lot of modern LMOs have done, and the weapon does not create your class, your class choice does. Some very high-end weapons and armor might have an active on-use ability, but the intention is for these abilities to not radically redefine how an archetype is played. All archetypes can equip up to two hand weapons and one ranged weapon. Some abilities require a specific weapon to be equipped. Weapons equipped in a ranged slot will automatically be shown when an ability that needs a ranged weapon is used. There are three armor types, light, medium, and heavy. Again, there are no class or archetype restrictions for these armor weights. Every class can use any armor type. Using a full set of one of these armor types will confer a set bonus. These set bonuses will have strengths and weaknesses in comparison to the other armor armor classes, and some armor types might be better suited for some encounters. The type of armor one is wearing will be shown on the character nameplate. The gear slots are shown on screen. The gear rarities are now seen on screen. Best in slot gear will depend on the encounter. There might not be one gear set that works best for every single encounter in the game. Gear will have tiers and there will be tier sets. As said before, most gear will not bind to a player and can be freely traded. Gear enhancements such as enchantment scrolls or tempering can be applied to gear. Enchanting works by the scribe profession creating scrolls that can be used by different professions to create enchantments relating to that profession. Enchantment scrolls can be sold on the open market and enchanting does not increase an item's level requirement. The developers plan to limit power creep via item sinks, the lack of gear binding, and the absence of pay-to-win mechanics. Ashes will also have a form of gear transmog with an appearance slot that is used to copy the appearance of one item to another item. In addition, attachments are able to be unlocked as flare pieces to armor to create a customizable look. There will be hundreds of attachments ranging from a clasp to the entire front of a breastplate. Some gear dying will also be in the game as well. There will also be multiple consumables in Ashes similar to most MMOs, food, potions, and more. And now the next huge topic, PvE. There are a lot of PvE options in Ashes. Much of the available PvE content revolves around the nodes and how they progress. Some PvE content might be available on one server but not on another because of differences in how nodes are developed. Questing is divided into four categories, events, commissions, story arc quests, and side quests. All three of these will be available from various places such as local commission boards, NPC quest givers, and other sources that players will discover. Quest givers and ashes are not marked with an exclamation point above their head like most modern MMOs do. Instead, NPCs that have quests have a green shimmer on their nameplate, and not every quest will originate from a node. Some quest givers will be separate from the node system. Events are things that happen in ashes as a result of 
development in the world. Several different types of events are triggered due to certain predicates being met. There are cooldowns before an event will repeat. Some events might trigger randomly if predicates are not triggered fast enough. Some events might only be available during certain steps of a story arc. Events are scaled to fit local, regional, and global needs. There are notifications that will trigger at the local, regional, or world level depending on the scale of the event. The currently known event types are shown on screen. Events do scale in difficulty based on the strength of participants and the rewards do increase as well for successful event completion. This event scaling is not based purely on player numbers. The scaling method used is to increase the number of enemy NPCs in the event. Events will have major consequences within the world if players do not successfully complete them. Failing an event could trigger bigger, more damaging events such as an NPC event that attacks a node building, and players might need to defend it or the building gets damaged. Some events could change the climate temporarily or block off specific roadways if not dealt with. All players can participate in an event, and most events will last 20 to 30 minutes, with some being longer. Events will be at an appropriate level to the content surrounding the event. Players will get rewarded for event participation if the event is not failed with a reward based on how much they contributed to the event. There are gold, silver, and bronze event contribution levels. Monster coin events are system spawn events that enable players to play as monsters within the event system. This ranges from playing as a horde of zombies to becoming a massive dragon. They are structured in a way to prevent groups from gaming the system. Monster coin events are triggered by activity in the world such as node advancement, defeating a boss, or constructing certain types of buildings within the node. Server messages appear for players in the vicinity of these dynamic events. The player will have a number of potential objectives they can choose to attack during the event. This may include node buildings, points of interest, dungeons, NPC, or other open world objectives. Commissions are simple types of system generated quests with singular objectives that enable characters and nodes to gain XP. These are posted on boards and nodes which refresh approximately every 30 minutes. Everybody in the node can see and access the commissions relevant to their level and node reputation. Commissions fall into different categories which you can see on screen. Commissions have assigned rarities which scale the rewards for their completion. More developed nodes will offer rarer commissions that are available to players with sufficient node reputation. Commissions respond to different conditions in the world such as the weather, time of day, story arcs, and events. Commissions attempt to lead players into areas where relevant content can be found. Players can only have a maximum of 20 active commissions at one time. This does not include other quest types such as side quests or story arc quests. The types of commissions available in a node will be representative of the identity of that node, such as its social and religious organizations and node policies. We talked about mayoral commissions during the node's discussion. These are similar, but they are purely system generated instead of initiated by the mayor. Story arcs are unlocked by multiple types of player activity within each server, including node progression. Story arcs have multiple possible endings depending on the quest objectives that players complete during each chapter. Developers intend for future expansions of the game to see continuation of some of the existing story arcs. There can only be so many active story arcs at one time, so even if story arc predicates are met, they might have to wait in a queue until a story arc is finished. Story arcs can initiate world events, and some of these events are only available during story arcs. There will be varying scales of story arcs, with some being smaller in scale than others. Story arc chapters when completed can cause changes across the entire server, affecting environments, monsters, NPCs, quests, and pathways. Players progress a story arc by completing story arc quests within a set time frame. If all quests are completed, players will have to wait until the next chapter to do the quests in the next chapter. Story arcs last for days, giving players ample time to complete them and reducing the need for players to log in every single day to not miss some content. Most story arcs will repeat with a cooldown, but major story arcs will only occur one time. The major story arcs can still be replayed by players, but the replays will not change the world like the original playthrough did. Quests within a story arc can be failed by a server, causing the server to fail that story arc chapter. Depending on node progression, retrying the story arc chapter might be possible. Story arcs will have rewards for players that complete them, and the rewards will be balanced for all the different outcomes to avoid a meta where one branch is favored over another based on the rewards. These rewards will not provide best in slot loot as that is reserved for crafting. The rewards will also not be the best source of XP or currency. In essence, story arcs are meant to deliver lore and story and change the state of the world based on the outcome of the story arcs. The narrative of a server is driven by the outcome of all the story arcs 
networks and node progression on the server. Moving on to the next quest type, side quests. Side quests are quests with a variety of objectives that pop up while venturing in the world. These quests give a variety of rewards and can lead into larger quest chains. Some side quests will spawn based on player activity and world states in a similar manner to commissions. Side quests will need to be turned back in at the quest giver, NPC. As for the difficulty of PvE content, raids and dungeons will adapt based on the performance of the raid against previous bosses in an encounter. Higher performance in earlier phases will increase the difficulty of subsequent phases and boost the loot table of bosses. Bosses and mobs will not auto-scale based on group size, but AI behaviors might dynamically adapt to the number and types of combatants in close proximity to the encounter. For example, more players in a fight might mean more AoE attacks. This scaling also applies to other content like events. There will be some mobs that are higher level than the player cap for the hardest PvE content, which is kind of a standard thing for most MMOs. There will not be level scaling of content that allows low level players to participate in high level content. As for the learning curve of the game, it is said to be easy to understand yet hard to master. Dungeons will be approximately 80% open world and the open world dungeons will have the hardest content and the best loot. The instance dungeons are more tailored for deliberate solo and group quest lines. The majority of content in Ashes is intended to be open world and not instanced. Only 20% of content in Ashes is instanced. Raids will either be based on triggered events or more traditional systems. Traditional world bosses will change based on node development. There are planned to be 12 to 15 raid bosses in the world. Legendary equipment can only drop from legendary world bosses, but the chance will be low and the materials these bosses drop can be used to craft legendary gear. Some raid content is only intended to be completed by a single digit percentage of the population. Raids will have elements that can be pre-planned as well as dynamic elements. The standard group composition of tank, heal, DPS, and support is needed, as well as proper positioning during certain mechanics. Dynamic elements include things like varying the types and numbers of mobs in the raid and their skill repertoire. Variables might also exist based on the number and type of metropolis nodes that are developed. Raid bosses will have fairly intricate mechanics. Multiple phase fights, adds, random skill usage, changing boss mechanics based on the climate or time of day, and telegraphed abilities. Adaptive PvE content such as new POI spawning, new buildings and mobs spawning, and the difficulty of content changing will all happen as nodes advance. New dungeons and new pathways and larger dungeons might open as nodes develop. Drop tables will change as well as nodes advance. Storyline objectives for players in dungeons will depend on the story arc paths chosen during node advancement. Dungeons and raids will also have leaderboards. Leaderboards are also planned for various PvP and gathering activities and leaderboards might be seasonal. Corrupted areas in the world can dynamically evolve with the progression of nodes and story arcs. These corrupted areas are sources of NPC events that players will need to address to stop the spread of corruption before it grows out of hand and causes the frequency of NPC events against their node to increase. Corrupted areas will spawn variations of mobs and resources. These corrupted resources are only available in corrupted areas or during certain story arcs. These resources are variations of normal resources that are necessary for crafting certain recipes. As for groups and ashes, the party size is 8 and the raid size is 40. PvE content will be tailored for 8, 16, and 40 man group sizes. Looting and ashes will follow traditional loot rules selected by the group leader with the group needing to approve any loot rule changes. There is planned for there to be an option to auto loot if you double tap the loot interact key. Loot tagging is based on a blended tag and damage done system. The first player or group to do damage to a mob gets a 5-10% to edge over competing parties in terms of the total damage done when determining loot rights. Solo and casual players will have plenty to do in Ashes as well. Some quest lines and hunting areas are tailored for solo players. Node citizenship and social organizations provide a lot of progression for solo and casual players. And even in the larger PvE and PvP encounters, solo and casual players can have a role. Let's get into player death mechanics in Ashes of Creation. Death does matter in Ashes and there will be consequences for dying. When a player dies, they disintegrate into Ash. The Ash contains items lost by the player due to applicable 
death penalties. The loot in these ash piles is lootable by other players. Players are not flagged for PvP by looting these piles. There are three flagging states in the PvP corruption system which we will detail in the PvP section. These flagging states are non-combatant, combatant, and corrupt. The flagging state will be visible on the character nameplate based on color with non-combatant being green, combatant being purple, and corrupt being red. A green non-combatant player who dies suffers normal death penalties which include the following, experience debt which is a negative experience that players will have to earn back before they start to earn experience again. This does not de-level a player or reduce their earned experience, it is more like a debuff that must be worked off before XP can be earned again. Experience debt caps out at 2-3% of the XP of a max level player. Players when dying also receive skill and stat dampening, reduction in drop rates from monsters, durability loss. The durability loss is both a gold and material sink, and dropping a percentage of gatherables, materials, and glint. Non-combatant players will not drop finished items, only unfinished gatherables and materials. The player's mule, if they are using one, can also be killed and gathered from. A combatant or purple player will suffer the exact same penalties but at half the rate of a non-combatant. All that is required to become a combatant is to fight back when attacked in PvP, so players will be encouraged to fight back to reduce their death penalty in PvP. Finally, a corrupt or red player, which is a player that kills someone who did not fight back and therefore died as a non-combatant, will suffer death penalties at four times the rate of a non-combatant. This is the main mechanism to reduce griefing in the always-on PvP of Ashes of Creation. In addition to the huge increase to the normal death penalty, corrupt players are the only flagging state where players have a chance to drop items upon death. This along with the increased drop rate of materials and gatherables means corrupt players will become big PvP targets, especially since killing them does not make you corrupt as well, only a combatant. And that covers the PvE of Ashes which brings us to another big topic and a big part of Ashes, the PvP. PvP is the catalyst for change in Ashes. The PvP is intended to be meaningful, ranging from small-scale caravan battles to large-scale castle sieges with hundreds of players. Most PvP will be experienced through opt-in, objective-based battlegrounds. These are high-risk and high-reward encounters that do not utilize the corruption system. These include castle and node sieges, caravans, guild wars, and naval PvP in the open seas. Death penalties for the most part do not apply to these objective-based PvP events, with the exception of gear degradation during caravan PvP. In addition to these structured PvP systems, there are some reasons to engage in PvP in the open world where corruption is enabled. Some of the reasons could be to contest open world dungeons or raids, or to contest scarce resources and hunting grounds. However, corruption penalties are so severe that griefing or killing players that do not fight back is intended to be minimal. Caravans are rolling Rolling open PvP zones that flag all players for PvP and do not have corruption enabled and are meant for transporting cargo across the map. Players when encountering a caravan can choose to attack, defend, or ignore the objective entirely. A group will be needed to successfully attack a caravan. Caravans can trigger events in the world as they travel. There are three types of caravans, personal caravans, mayoral caravans, and system-driven caravans. Personal caravans are utilized by players to transport cargo across Vera. These are land-based and water-based caravans that a single player drives and directs. Personal caravans are launched from caravansary buildings at the village or stage three or higher nodes. Personal caravans can be summoned in the open world from caravansary in nearby nodes, and the time to summon them in the open world is dependent on how far from the node the summon takes place. Personal caravans are capable of transitioning to and from raft caravans anywhere land intersects with water. Raft caravans are the only naval vessel usable on rivers. Raft caravans have the same stats as the land caravan they transition from. Caravans have a default racial appearance that can be modified with caravan skins. Caravan drivers receive a significant defensive buff when they are driving a caravan. This reduces CC effects and increases damage mitigation significantly. Caravan owners can grant permissions to allow other players to drive their caravans. If these permissions are not activated, then anyone can drive them. If the caravan driver is killed or removed from the caravan, then any player will be able to drive the caravan for a period of 15 to 20 minutes before it despawns and becomes wreckage. Caravans will also persist in the world for 5 to 10 minutes after the owner disconnects from a server. Caravans do have collisions, so players can jump onto them while they are being driven. 
Players or mounts that try to block them will be pushed out of the way. Mayoral caravans are launched by mayors to obtain needed resources from other nodes. Nodes answering these trade requests must have a trade agreement or alliance with the requesting node. Once a node fills a request, a system-driven caravan moves towards the node. Players can choose to attack or defend these system-driven caravans. System-driven caravans are system-spawned caravans that are used for trade routes between nodes. The caravansary is a default service building pre-built in every stage 3 node and can be upgraded over time to add additional benefits. This is where caravans are constructed, prepared for launch, and unloaded. Construction of caravans from caravan components happen at these caravan master NPCs. These components modify stats and provide abilities to the caravan. There is a trade-off when outfitting a caravan. You might choose to maximize speed at the expensive survivability, for example. Caravan components and skins affect the caravan's appearance. This is the list of caravan stats that can be affected, and currently there are five slots for caravan stat upgrades and five slots for active skills. This is the list of active skills seen for caravans so far. Caravan cargo refers to crates that are loaded onto the caravan. These crates can also be transported by mules and merchant ships. Crates use a spatial inventory system like a player's material inventory uses. Crates can be loaded with materials and resources, player commodities, and node commodities. Cargo for shipment by caravan is stored at the caravansary, not in the player's inventory, and is visible in the warehouse UI. Cargo capacity can be upgraded through various caravan components. There are visual hints planned for giving potential attackers an idea of what kind of cargo is loaded on a caravan. Caravan drivers, after they have put their components and cargo into a caravan, will then get an item in their bags they can use to launch the caravan. When launching a caravan, players will see a visible perimeter around nodes that represents a disembarkation radius, which is the limit that a caravan can be launched from. Caravans, after they launch, create an objective PvP event in the open world that players can opt in to attack, defend, or ignore. The proximity of when this UI window notification appears varies based on a player's progression in the Highwayman system, which is a progression system for caravans and the caravan components that are installed in the caravan. Caravans have active abilities that can help with defense, and caravans have a large health pool that has to be taken to zero to destroy the caravan. If a caravan is destroyed or it despawns, it becomes wreckage with various individual crates on the ground that contain a portion of the cargo the caravan was transporting. The remainder of the caravan's goods are destroyed when the caravan is destroyed. Caravan components and the caravan itself are also destroyed and cannot be salvaged in the wreckage. Any commodity crates in the wreckage are marked with a green symbol. Materials crates are marked with a black symbol. Anyone can loot this wreckage. Unsealing these crates on the ground will incur a further loss of materials and in addition to the amount lost when the caravan was initially destroyed. Players can spawn a caravan from the nearest node that will vary in spawn time based on how far away that node is. Once the caravan arrives, it can then be used to pick up these crates without unsealing them, thereby giving more value for them. But this caravan will still need to be successfully transported to a node. The Highwayman system is the caravan progression system. It tracks a player's performance in caravan PvP, including successful attacking and defending, and provides rewards that scale up over time based on performance. These rewards include things like a changing proximity radius for notifications, better equipment, faster ways to open crates, higher yield from crates, and better caravan components. Castle sieges are an integral part of PvP in Ashes as well. Before we get into castle sieges, we need to talk about castles first. There are five guild castles, and each will influence one-fifth of the world. One castle is located on an island and can be affected by naval combat. The castles will initially be occupied by an NPC adversary. These are the primary antagonists in the storyline. Once a guild first takes a castle from the NPCs, then there will be castle sieges every month. During the lead-up to the siege, guilds will need to upgrade castle defenses. Each castle has three nodes that need to be developed each month by the guild that controls the castle in order to bolster the castle defenses during the siege. Questing is the method that is used to upgrade these nodes. One of the ways the castle defenses are developed is every weekend leading up to the siege, caravans will move towards one of the castle nodes carrying the taxes collected during the week. Successfully defending these caravans will bolster that node and increase the defense of the castle during the siege. Enemies of the guild that own 
owns the castle will obviously be incentivized to attack and destroy these caravans. Citizens of the node that are under the control of the castle cannot attack the caravans, they can only defend. The controlling guild will likely not be able to fully upgrade these castle nodes on their own, and they will likely need some assistance from other guilds to do this. The castle nodes are always military nodes and cannot advance past stage 3. They exist outside of the normal node system. Mercenary NPCs can be used to protect castle caravans, and they can be hired for the castle siege, depending on how well the nodes have been developed. There are many benefits given to the guild that owns a castle, so expect them to be highly contested. As said, each castle controls one-fifth of the world map, and any developed nodes under the control of the castle will be taxed by the castle. A portion of these taxes can only be used exclusively for building up the defenses of the castle, but a portion can be used by the guild for whatever they want. In addition, castle owners can activate special events and abilities that benefit the node citizens under their rule, and they can unlock special node buildings within the nodes under their control as well. As for the monthly castle sieges, the sieges will only happen during a server primetime window. The minimum goal for these sieges is for them to accommodate 250 versus 250 on a single battlefield, but the developers are hoping for as much as 500 versus 500. There may be instance locations within otherwise open world castle or node sieges where specific groups can participate in small short duration objective based battles that will affect the overall outcome of the siege. The fourth and final week before the castle siege is the declaration week. During this time guilds can sign up to a defend or attack the castle. Once a guild registers to attack a castle, a siege scroll declaration quest is initiated that guild members may participate in, and it is possible to lay this declaration scroll down as soon as this quest is completed. Multiple guilds can register to attack, but the first to complete the scroll and lay down the declaration will be the one that is chosen to be the attacking guild. The siege scroll deployment is a 5 minute rooted in place cast that alerts the region of the cast initiation and names the caster. The caster must be the guild leader. The casting can only be interrupted by killing the caster. The scroll can only be cast in a ring around the castle. Following siege declaration, the defending guild can approve defenders, hire mercenary NPCs, and set up defensible positions. The attackers will need to approve attackers and craft all the siege equipment needed for the siege. The castle sieges will have waypoints that attackers can capture, and when they do their respawn timer is diminished. Legendary NPCs will act as mini raid bosses that can be killed by either side for various benefits. The defender's goal is to survive until the 90 minute siege timer ends. The attackers will need to reach the inner keep of the castle, and once there, a guild leader or designed officer must cast a 3 to 5 minute cast to seal ownership of the castle. Casting time will be diminished based on how many capture points the attacker sold. There is an opportunity for any guild leader in the attacking alliance to capture the castle themselves, even if they did not lay down the declaration skull, which creates potential inner guild drama between the attackers. And as already mentioned in the mounts section, the flying mount dragons for the defenders will be a strong weapon for the defenders. And that concludes the castle and castle sieging discussion. Node sieges are of course another massive PvP feature in Ashes, but we covered them during the node discussion earlier. Next let's talk about Guild Wars. There is not a lot known about Guild Wars just yet, but the goal of Guild Wars is for them to be objective based with great risk involved for both sides. Guild Wars can be declared at any time, but the objectives will only spawn during server prime time. Guild Wars will not be permanent. Definitive victory conditions exist exist that will end the war. Some examples of guild war objectives are capturing some objective near the enemy guild hall on a freehold. There also might be bounty objectives to kill a specific guild member. Quickly on guild halls, since I mentioned them, these can be placed within baronies near nodes or in nodes. In node guild halls will have different benefits than barony guild halls. The number of guild hall spots available within baronies is determined by the node stage. Guild halls and baronies of patron guilds will confer benefits to any guild freeholds in that barony. When a guild reaches a certain level, the guild leader gets a certificate that enables placement of a guild hall. In node guild halls are only available to guilds that are patrons of a node. The guild will need to achieve a certain guild level to unlock guild halls. In addition to guild halls, there was also talk at one time of guild fortresses. The last comments from the developers suggest this is a design that might be on the shelf. But if they do make it into the game, they will likely be siegeable during guild wars and be a guild war objective. Guild wars will be one of the activities that is shown on the guild ladder. Castle sieges and world bosses will also appear on the guild ladder. 
Guild Wars will also be part of the six month long PvP seasons. There also is not a lot known about Node Wars, other than Vassal Nodes cannot declare a Node War on Parent Nodes or other Vassal Nodes, and like Guild Wars, Node Wars are objective based and the objectives occur during server prime time. One important thing to cover regarding PvP and Ashes is the affiliation tree. This determines what has priority in terms of War and Ashes. No citizenship is the highest priority affiliation a player has. So for example, if two nodes are at war, but both nodes have members of the same guild in them, then those members will be at war with each other. Another PvP option in Ashes is Naval PvP, which we have already covered when we went over the naval systems. Just to recap, in terms of PvP, the open seas will not have the corruption system enabled. Close to the shoreline, corruption is enabled. Arenas are an instanced PvP option in Ashes as well. There will be 1-man, 3-man, 5-man, and possibly 20-man free-for-all group sizes in the arenas. There will not be guild versus guild arenas, but players can queue as teams. Arenas will have a minimum level requirement, and there will not be arena brackets, just one arena mode for all players that meet the minimum level requirement. There will be an arena ladder, and the arenas will be part of the PvP seasons. The PvP season rewards include gear enhancement rewards, achievement ranks, and currency. That covers all of the structured PvP options that do not have the corruption system enabled. Now it's time to talk about the open PvP and how the corruption system works. Corruption is a system that is designed to prevent griefing of players in the open world. The penalty for those that gank players who do not fight back is extremely severe. There are three flagging states and ashes, non-combatants which have a green nameplate, combatants with a purple nameplate, and corrupted with a red nameplate. The flagging states and all of the possible flagging combinations are seen in this chart. It looks very complicated at first glance, but in reality, it is not that complicated. The only way someone can become corrupted is to first become a combatant by attacking a combatant or non-combatant, and then they get a killing blow on a non-combatant. Combatants killing combatants do not become corrupted. Non-combatants are free to attack corrupted players without becoming combatants themselves. All players start as non-combatants. Any non-forced player attacks such as AoE and status effects will not hit a combatant player. If a combatant player is fighting a non-combatant and the player dies to a mob, then the combatant will not become corrupted. Players are flagged as combatants if they attack another player. If the player fights back, they are also flagged as a combatant. Non-combatants who heal or support a combatant will be flagged as combatants as well. Killing a combatant player will not flag a player as corrupt. Players remain flagged for 90 seconds after their last attack, and cannot log out while flagged as a combatant. The only way a player can become corrupted is by killing a non-combatant. Their corruption score will increase with each subsequent non-combatant killed, and killing a non-combatant that is much lower level will cause that score to increase much faster. Players will also have a lifetime PK value score, which also increases the rate at which players become corrupted. There might be quests to slowly reduce this score, but this is something that will be a long-term negative for players that grief, further disincentivizing PKing. As stated in the death penalty section, once a corrupted player is eventually killed, they will see a 4x increase on the standard death penalty, and they will have a chance to drop gear. And the penalties increase in severity the higher the corruption score of the player is. Even more penalties for corrupted players is that they cannot trade with other players. They cannot interact with vendors or NPCs, and they cannot access storage. And since players cannot become corrupted by themselves killing a corrupt player, and can then loot the corpse that drops 4x the normal amount of materials, players are naturally incentivized to attack and kill these corrupt players. And remember, corruption does decrease the combat effectiveness of these players by a substantial amount, so it might be a fairly easy task to kill them. On top of that incentive, there is even a bounty hunter system in place as well that will encourage even more players to seek out and kill corrupted players. Starting at stage 4 in military nodes, citizens of that node and potentially even citizens of vassal nodes of that military node can become a bounty hunter. With this, they can see active corrupt players on their map to make it very easy to track them down and kill them. The primary and quickest way to remove corruption is through a corrupted player dying. Gaining experience will slowly reduce corruption as well. Suffice it to say, I believe that corruption will be very punishing and prevent a lot of griefing. But at the same time, those that don't mind PvP might fight back when ganked to reduce their own death penalty by 50% and have a chance to loot their enemies. 
In theory, this system could allow for natural, organic, open-world PvP, but still be very punishing for griefers. But, of course, we'll have to wait and see when we finally get to test this in Alpha 2 this year. And with that, we have fully covered the PvP section. And now we can move on to covering guilds and alliances. We have already covered a lot of what we need to cover with guilds in terms of guild halls, guild fortresses, and guild castles in the PvP section. But let's cover the basics of guilds and guild alliances here. Forming a guild is similar to how it is in most MMOs. You will need at least 5 players to start a guild. There is a minimum level requirement, a quest line to complete, and a gold and material cost. Currently, the guild size cap is 300 players. This is done to reduce the effectiveness of Zerd guilds. Smaller guilds will be allowed to have bigger guild buffs in the guild leveling system, which is another method to strengthen small guilds and weaken Zergs. The maximum cap for a guild to have the max buffs to their guild is 30 to 50 players. Guild alliances are also a mechanic that allows up to four guilds to form an alliance. There will also be a guild alliance bank, alliance-specific chat channels and quest lines, and affiliations and gear that can be attained as well. There are also many other planned benefits to guild membership as you can see here. That covers guilds, now let's move on to religions and social organizations. Ashes has six primary religions as well as the Tolnar religion. Choosing a religion allows a player to walk a light or dark path through their choice of quest lines and other actions. The main way to progress a religion's influence on a server will be to build the corresponding temple in a stage 3 or higher divine node. As players advance their rank within their chosen religion, they will gain access to the following benefits. Unique titles and shop items, discounts from various vendors, roles that open up during events or node sieges as long as the node has a temple dedicated to the player's deity, and the player is the citizen of that node. Unique augments can be unlocked as a top tier achievement within a religion, and unique crafting recipes can also be unlocked. Players can only follow one religion at a time, and changing religions will cause all progress to be lost. Players can also build shrines on their freeholds and unlock some of the same features that node temples have. There are also social organizations in Ashes such as the Traders Company, the Thieves Guild, and the Scholars Academy. Social organizations start to unlock in nodes at Stage 4. Players can only be in one social organization. Progression in social organization provides rewards such as titles, special shops, abilities that can only be used in node sieges, or other events, and up to 3-4 to four augments. There will also be special cosmetics and a role for social organizations within artisan class progression. Progression in social organizations is based on tasks or quests that have to be completed. These quests will either be cooperative or adversarial against other nodes based on node war status. With religions and social organizations done, it's time to move on to leveling. Leveling will not follow a traditional leveling path, although classic mechanics for leveling do exist. Players will earn XP in a wide variety of ways from events and questing, gathering, processing, and crafting, and killing mobs. Group XP gain will use a formula of roughly 1.3 to 1.4 times the number of players in the party, which is then split evenly amongst the party members. The developers do not want grinding to be the primary method for XP gain. The goal is for there to be more things to do in the game than players have time for. There will not be level boosts or AFK leveling. There will not be level scaling mechanics in PvP or PvE. In theory, a player could level to max at one node, since nodes will have content for all or most level ranges, but that will likely not be the best choice. The level cap at launch is expected to be level 50. Alpha 2 is expected to have a level cap of 35. It will take a long time to hit max level, with it taking approximately 45 days of playing 4 to 6 hours per day. That covers leveling. Now let's talk about all the progression options in Ashes. The objective is to provide both horizontal and vertical progression options. Repetition is not said to be a large part of progression in Ashes. Progression pathways are per character. The end game is said to be different in that the developers want people to be experiencing similar content at in-game that they experience while leveling. Players can progress their class, gear, pets, artisan classes, religions, mirror classes that can help progress nodes, that can progress their guilds, progress their social organizations. There is alliance progression, freehold progression, caravan progression, guild and arena ladder progression, and even monster coin progression. The bottom line, you are not likely to run out of things to do anytime soon in Ashes. We have already touched on most of these progression systems in Ashes other than pets, yes, Ashes also has combat pets that players can buy and even gear up. These pets do not provide vertical progression for the player, instead they offer a horizontal progression path. Getting into some of the ancillary details of the game, Rapid Fire 
as we end this video. The monetization is sub only with no box cost, no pay to win, only a cosmetic only cash shop. Equitable cosmetics to the ones sold in the cash shop can be earned in game. Intrepid plans to have post launch updates with a cadence that will vary based on how popular the game is. Expansions will not have a cost, just the normal sub fee. Intrepid is not planning to have narrated quest lines that are fully voice acted at launch, although they are not ruling it out. They are considering using AI for voice acting. There will be some NPC voice greetings and some bosses and creatures will have voice lines. The music for the game is being made by composer Bear McCreary and his work will be unveiled at some point in Alpha 2. Intrepid is planning to have active game masters and robust security to track bots, gold settlers, and cheaters. Intrepid wants the game to be very performant with large-scale sieges that operate without the game turning into a slideshow. They have custom networking code that so far has shown some impressive progress towards massive sieges being possible in Ashes. On screen are the current minimum and recommended specs for Ashes Alpha 2. The developers are using Unreal Engine 5.2 as of September 2023, and they are working on moving to 5.3. The game UI is meant to be highly customizable with players able to save UI profiles and transition between them very quickly. If you've stuck with me this far, kudos to you for watching an incredibly long video about a game that we cannot even play yet. As I said in the beginning, this video is much longer than last year because there was a lot of new information added in the past year. I want to thank everybody for the support after the last video I did on everything known about Ashes of Creation, which obviously was very long and took a lot of work. And all that support motivates me to continue going and make more videos like this. Again, if you need a guild for Ashes of Creation, my guild Genesis is recruiting. Don't forget to follow me on Twitch where I'll be streaming Ashes nonstop as soon as I can. And of course, like this video and subscribe. That helps a lot. And that's all I have for this one. I'll see you guys in Alpha 2 and the next Everything Known About Ashes of Creation video in 2025, which who knows how long that might be. Maybe four or five hours at this point. Who knows? We'll see you guys later.